Hello, friends, to sort of part three of our Halloween streamathon. Yes, hello. We've got a very special episode today. We started off on Friday night, of course, with the uh, gee, what are we doing Friday night? It was the Black Spaceberg. It was the iceberg theory Q and A follow up where we went to outer space and addressed some crazy things that we didn't even get to in the iceberg. Then on Sunday, of course, I think I did my best live stream ever. It's pretty unanimous, right? That was the high point of the LML YouTube channel, uh, the Nimble Dick Squisher Hunt stream on Sunday. If you missed that, I'm not sure what you're doing. Uh, not sure what you're doing, but you better watch that air stream. And that is up on the YouTube channel. So today, today to round out the uh, spooky, spooky streaming run here will be a little stream about the crypts of Winterfell. And I have done a stream about the crypts before. It was at least four years ago, maybe five years ago. Uh, it was conducted with YouTubers who shall no longer be named here. And the stream, I have taken it down. So it's time for a fresh investigation in the crypts. Something is down there. And to help figure out just what that is, I have a very special guest. You know him from the chat. The man, the myth. The chef, Gray Waste Tim, say hello. Hello, everybody. And the chat goes crazy. <sighs> and uh, I felt appropriate for the stream today. I'm wearing the Fraternal Order of Grave Robbers. Oh, yes. We're definitely going to open some graves today. <laughs> so thanks for joining me, Tim. And thanks for coming strong with the notes and mm -hmm. the research. Of course, Tim does like to write essays on... The place called Reddit. What's your handle on Reddit? Is it just Gray Waste, Tim? Yeah, it's also uh, Raiders of the Gray Waste. That was my name before. I just felt like it was too long. So I went with Gray Waste, Tim. It's a play on Gray Waste It, which is actually something I came up watching your streams with the question of uh, what happens when you mix Weirwood Paste and Shade of the Evening Wind? Well, you get purple drank and you get Gray Waste It. I, I totally remember that conversation, actually. That's awesome. Uh, that's just very nice. <laughs> and so. uh, something people will notice with me, especially if you read the essay I pinned, which is uh, Fagon, uh, Parallel of Kings, Princes, and Pretenders. Uh, my big thing is uh, noting the parallels that George likes to do. Like, again, like just our title alone, A Song of Ice and Fire is a huge parallel. And when you read the story, you pick up George does this a lot. There's a lot of parallels, a lot of foils. Things in Westeros will have a very similar thing in Essos going for them. And it's just all over the place. And those are the things that I love picking up on. So, yeah, the um, his use of parallelism dovetails nicely with his love of cycles and transformations. And so you see, um, you know, all these cycles of life and death. Uh, summer and winter, day and night, but then George will juxtapose them and force us to compare them in parallel and show us similar concepts manifest manifesting, you know, one side and the other. So yes, uh, it's it's everything is very dynamic. And when I first started getting into the symbolism and the art, discovering the archetypes, which is essentially the foundation upon which the the parallelism is built. Um, at first, it was challenging, Tim, because I was I was annoyed that the characters kept changing so much. It's like, if Danny's Nissa Nissa and the Moon Maiden, then why is she also the dragon and Azor High Reborn? And, and it's like, oh, well, the moon dies and gives birth to the dragons, which actually is like becoming the dragons. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what Danny does. Her naivety and her youth, her innocence dies, and emer she emerges from the pyre as the dragon, as an Azor High figure. So... George is using all of these archetypes, whether they're the, the mythical ones or the long night ones, as basically phases that people can move through because he's always wanting to tie his symbolism to what? The, the heart in conflict, which is all about character growth and dynamism, right? Yes. And uh, I like that he, he does do that. And like when we look at the symbolism mythology is drawing upon you think of like how every culture in the world has its own flood myth and george even picks up on that like with the the hammer of the waters it's it's its own sort of flood flood myth that's that he has built into this world and when we look at characters like knight's king azor ahai the bloodstone emperor 
And it's like, are all three of these the same person? Are these three separate individuals? And he writes it in a language where it could go either way. Maybe they are all the same. Maybe they're two. Maybe one guy is two out of three, or maybe they are all separate, distinct individuals. And at a certain point, I made a conscious choice to not try to drill down to that level of specificity and rather say that, well, you know, they could be the same person or it could be a father, son, or there could have been a group mm -hmm. of flaming sword sorcerers that are all Azor high uh, that get remembered in the myth. So, you know, it's it's unlikely that everything goes back to one person. So it's mm -hmm. almost inevitable that there was multiple people. And we've seen so many brother, brother, father, son and uncle, nephew rivalries and fights that the idea of a family struggle is is very compelling and seems to be along the right lines. So essentially what we're going to do today, folks, um, you know, everyone has taken a stab at trying to answer this question of what is in the crypts of Winterfell. It's one of the first places we see in the story. Winterfell is obviously kind of like home base and the crypts are the oldest part of, of the castle. They're filled with mystique. And our main one of our main characters, John, of course, has the recurring dream of walking down to the lowest levels of the crypts. And it's very conspicuously always cut off before we get to the end and before John gets to the end. So it's pretty clear there's a big stinking secret here. And it's pretty clear it has something to do with John and that's probably RLJ. So that's kind of the starting point of what we're talking about here. Um, this is kind of like the other half of the Tower of Joy mystery it's all about John. Um, and John obviously feels alienated throughout the dream because he's like, oh, this is a stark place. This is not my place. And yet he's feel compelled to go there. And obviously the answer would, would have something to do with the fact that he is both Stark and Targaryen and has to embrace that sort of duality, right? Yeah. Yeah, because John's dreams, he, he says that if the, the Stark statues are judging him. And one of the things about the Stark statues is uh, it does feel like they are watching you. You get the feeling that people get the feeling that they're they're moving, that maybe there's like a subtle twitch, an eye moving. Theon sees it. Ned has it in his dreams. And that is a real life phenomenon. It's called you know, a waterfall vision, which is when the light uh, hits the retina in such a way that you can't really get a good grasp on what it is you're seeing. And your brain just starts to play tricks on you. And George leaves it very open of like, okay, well, is this just the brain playing tricks on me because you're down in the crypts and the light is dim? Or are these things actually moving around? And what's what's 100% sure is that George wants to give the reader the feeling uh, that these stone kings are aware in some sense. They're spirits, they're the karma, something. There is something active about these crypts that needs to be reckoned with. Um, and it's actually really heavy handed when you go back and reread that first chapter with Ned and Robert. There's I think I counted up one time and there's a there's just so many references to the eyes moving and watching and the kings having feelings about what's going on and all kind of anthropomorphization. So. Um, so, yes, that's it's a lively place for a hall of the dead. <laughs> and we should mention that uh, an interest, of course, I wore my Stark Targaryen hybrid sigil shirt here. And the thing is that both Stark and Targaryen, their sigils and their house vibe, if you will, are rooted in Cerberus, the same mythology. Cerberus, of course, is the three headed dog or hound of hell who guards the entrance to the underworld. Um, the Winterfell crypts are very obviously an entrance to the underworld. And there's a lot of Hades and Persephone uh, symbolism layered onto Lyanna, Ned, and Rhaegar and all that. Rhaegar being Hades abducting Lyanna, um, Persephone down to the underworld. You know, just a, same thing with Bale the Bard. We're going to talk about Bale the Bard and the Echo there. Same thing. They hid in the crypts. Rhaegar and Lyanna absconded mysteriously, but it's the same idea. It's just abduction. And so getting back to Cerberus... Cerberus is a three-headed hellhound that guards the underworld. And so if you sort of look at the, uh, on, you know, Stark has a one-headed hellhound that guards the underworld because, of course, the direwolves are in the crypts. And then you see the three-headed dragon of House Targaryen. And House Targaryen is another underworld symbolism house. Everything that you see with House Targaryen is 
stinks of death and you know hell and you know all that stuff so a common mythical origin for these two houses uh and down in the crypts we're gonna you know it's it's if it's all about john's heritage then it's essentially about his i dual identity as a stark and a targaryen right yeah and I think that's one of the reasons why when we look at the statues of the Starks, they all have uh, a sword laid out in their lap. And symbolically, that it means it is, they're denying guest right. Now, Lyanna's statue is the only one that doesn't have a sword, which means she's the only one not denying guest right. So when John has these dreams where he feels unwelcome, well, no, there there is one Stark down there oh. who is welcoming you. Okay, I like that. And we do expect that a mother would be welcoming and comforting to her child. And I think that's what Ned had gotten across by specifically having her statue erected in such a way. Yeah. And uh, that's, I love that. It's a, that's a great point because I definitely think that there's a high probability that John will encounter Leanna's ghost um, in when he finishes this dream which he will likely do while he's dead inside of Ghost, right? Are we on the same page here? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so, I'm on the Ghost is going to be his soul jar for a little while. Uh, yeah, John I mean, the Wolf Man. <laughs> it's it's you know I I claim a certain amount of credit, but that idea predates me for sure. Radio Westeros has been talking about John coming back wolfish, and it goes back to the forums. I mean, it's but once you have the Varamir Sixkins prologue, it's pretty much just a matter of thinking about it um, yeah. and figuring well, out what's going on. So one and realizing thing I, that John's I'm jugular sorry. has been cut and he's definitely dead. <laughs> I'm sorry if I was interrupting, but one thing I want to note was again when we we're talking about John, John's parentage with Liana, then there's also we also got to talk Rhaegar. Obviously, Rhaegar dies on the Trident, and the Trident has these three forks: the Green Fork, the Red Fork, and the Blue Fork. And we're left to wonder: well, John's coming back, but what's going to bring him back? Is it going to be? Melisandre? Is he going to be otherized? Is it going to be Bran? And I think it might be this, this like tug of war between these three sects of magic. And probably what's going to happen is it, uh, John's probably going to, his soul is going to be in Ghost temporarily. And in the meantime, John might also, his body might temporarily be otherized. And for a moment, he will be this Night's King figure. And I see him being wrestled back from this by Bran with Green Seer magic and Mel with fire magic. And again, so it's green. John will be the forks of the trident. Green, red, blue, the same place where his father Rhaegar was killed. Right. And so that way, John is Aquaman, who was <laughs> played by a Cal Drogo actor and Drogo's Danny's first husband. So you can see it all lines up there. No, I'm, that's I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's a great point. Uh, the the trident is no doubt a clue about red, green, and blue magic, especially when you understand that the green sea, you know, is a metaphor for the weird net. So you've got a river with these three colors, and it's named the trident, which is the weapon of a sea god, you know, Poseidon, and yeah. so, or or even Indra, if you want to go there. But the point is that the weapon of the sea god is made up of like these three branches of magic. So it kind of shows you ice and fire magic. You know, they may be rooted in weirwood magic or they may be corruptions of that or have splintered off, or perhaps we should all think about it as nature magic. You know, some of which comes through the trees, some through the element of ice and some through the element of fire. But I definitely like that idea of the tug of war over John's body. I, because that's what matches the foreshadowing. You can see all this clear foreshadowing of, John being otherized, but it's also pretty clear John's going to be a fire whites. And it's clear that John, if he is otherized, we need to get him back. He can't just be otherized. And that's the story. Mm -hmm. So, and then there's the whole thing with the, you know, the green seers or the children telling Bran, Oh, don't try to raise the dead. You can't do that by the way, but don't try because it's <laughs> very impossible. Like, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. What, what else aren't you telling me? Exactly. So the, the other thing that I will make a point of, I, I've sort of said, you know, this has to do with something with Leanna, you know, either John's identity, potentially Leanna's ghost. I want to point out that it's said over and over that the bones remember. And it's, of course, we know Leanna's bones were brought back from the Tower of Joy and put in the crypts. So to the extent her spirit is lingering anywhere, it's in the crypts where her bones are because the bones remember. 
And we've already seen Ned have that dream of her statue sort of weeping blood. So mm -hmm. that's where he perceives her spirit to be. And when Ned dies, the children, of course, perceive his spirit to be in the crypt. So it's a safe bet that if Leanna's spirit is anywhere, it's down there, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and then going more on what else could be in Leon's tomb, when we think of like what could be under her tomb, that's when we get to the idea that I had proposed to you about Rhaegar's harp, if we want to jump into that. So let's go ahead and um, introduce the idea of Rhaegar's harp. I'm going to go get the cockatoo, and I'll be back in about 30 seconds. Okay. Hello, chat. I'm just going to see what some of y'all are saying until he gets back. Oh, yeah, ancient connection between Starks and Strongs. There's also also Stout. Um, and I always like to think of uh, Strong Start Stout, uh, the man with the strength of 20 Danny DeVitos. And, uh, okay. If LML's getting his birds, I'm just going to bring up my guy because he's playing with... He's playing with the, the headphone jack thinking it's a toy. Like, you think all these wires are toys and you have so many toys. You have so many toys on the floor. Why are you playing with the headphones and the microphone? <laughs> Great ways, Tim. I see you've learned from the maestro here. When in doubt, throw the pets on there. Absolutely. Uh, it's yep. always a winner. Uh, so, guys, there's 200 people watching. Please, if you appreciate what we're doing, click the like button. Make sure you're subscribed. Make sure the subscription bell is set to all notifications, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, real quick, let's shout out Gray Area. You are a mod on Gray Area's channel. Gray Area, of course. Yes. Yes, uh, I'm also. Wanna... I was just going to uh, say, look, we love Gray Area here. She is myth head friend. And uh, yeah, so we're going to mention her, I think, later in the somewhere in the notes here as well. But mm -hmm. shout out to Gray Area. So. Rhaegar's harp. Um, well, the first point I'm looking at your notes here, and the first point you're making is just that it's one of the most recognizable symbols of legitimacy that we could possibly have yeah. as far as proving that John is Rhaegar's child, right? Yeah, because when we every every single time Rhaegar's harp is mentioned, they talk about how it's uh, it has these silver strings and it plays the this melancholy tune. And when Rhaegar plays the tune, uh, plays a song for Leona at Heron Hall. It caused her to weep. And I've often wondered what that song was. And I think it might actually be Jenny's song that he had played for her. And it's possible that he may have written that song for the ghost of High Heart, specifically for her. And the reason that she's constantly requesting Tom O7 strings to play that for her is not only in remembrance to Jenny, but also probably as a remembrance of Rhaegar. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I think that is implied by the ghost of High Heart, uh, by her, by what she says. So, I think that's a good bet. And um, and if not, then it might have been something even sadder. Because uh, remember, Rhaegar, like just think about how emo it is for him to go back to Summer Hall. It's like the place where all of his family died yeah. when he was born, and so he goes there and hangs out and just to close sort of drink in the vibes and write some music. I mean, it's got to be the saddest music anywhere. But in any case, the point is, of course, that the silver strings, as you say, very distinctive. This is a one-of-a-kind harp. This is like Jimmy Page's Les Paul, you know, or something. Like, is anybody, you know, certain people would see, would uh, recognize it on site. And if a bunch of people were to put it on a table and say, what is this thing? It, it very quickly, the consensus would form around what it is. So yep. it it's, um, and you mentioned that, that Fagon is going to be popping up some symbols of legitimacy. And so John's going to need some himself. And it almost starts to devolve into a Monty Python life of Brian thing. We're like, follow the gourd, follow the shoe. Right. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Cause I, when we think Fagon and his symbols of legitimacy, like it's, it's, heavily implied he's going to get Blackfire, that that's one of the things in the chest that Illyrio is giving him. Um, I've also, I've mentioned it a lot, and I think you kind of got on board, the idea that uh, Doran Martell 
might present him with the crown of Aegon the Conqueror. Uh, the last time it was seen was on Daeron the First, the young dragon, and he was killed in Dorne. So I, I think the Martells have been sitting on that one. Um, but the problem, why not, with, right? Like, why yeah. not? It should, you know, <laughs> why not? <laughs> But as even though Blackfire is the sword of the Conqueror, it also kind of has that stigma of it's associated with bastards because of the numerous Blackfire rebellions. So if John pops up with Rhaegar's heart, it can that's more that seems like a stronger item to have because that's a direct connection to Rhaegar. Whereas Fagon having Blackfire, well, it's like okay, well, you have something that's associated with usurpers, right? And it's so like, well, are you well, really you on the that, up and up? It's like, where'd you get that sword, by the way? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that one actually could black uh, backfire if <laughs> the Blackfire backfire. Oh, new video coming! <laughs> the Blackfire backfire. Oh, that's too catchy. Oof. Don't steal that one, Gray Waste Tim. That's mine. <laughs> <laughs> and that, uh, uh, no, I'm kidding. Um, so. Uh, that's that's good. So again, it, this is the kind of thing that George loves to do. Obviously, he's doing the classic fantasy trope with his prophecies where, you know, there is a prince that was promised and the prophecies will be fulfilled in some way. But he clearly is much more fascinated with people misinterpreting, say, what the red comet means, or even Rhaegar trying to figure out which comet is the important one and which child is the third out of the dragon. And so the idea that um, different rivals are going to have different symbols of legitimacy. Danny will have dragons. Fagon will have the sword and maybe the crown. He'll have his fake Arthur Dane with Dawn, you know, Dark Star. And he'll have these, he'll sit on the Iron Throne. So he's going to look mm -hmm. like the king. But then, yeah, John eventually shows up with something like Rhaegar's harp or, and or some other uh, symbol of legitimacy. You could even be a note. It could be witnesses of the marriage you know signing the howland reed signing his name saying i saw this mm -hmm. or maester or something yeah. you know they they did something like that with the show right where there was a maesterly record of the wedding yeah that uh his marriage to elia martell was annulled and that he remarried to liana stark so um but in the book like we know that uh that's a ragger right doesn't she call him rieger or ragger or something I can't, it's been so long since I've watched yeah, it. Yeah, right. after after season eight, I kind of just like I don't think I want to rewatch anymore. Or Fair. maybe I, yeah, no, I'll rewatch the first. <laughs> I'll rewatch the first four seasons, and this show died with Tywin on the toilet. <laughs> so, uh, real quick, let me just uh, interject. I just saw a PayPal come through, and I will. Um, I've I've come up with a clever way to get you guys to participate in today's stream. So, obviously, we're going through the crypts, and as you know. There are a few people hiding out in our version of the crypts. Um, old Nan is always down there, you know, sweeping and, and just keeping up. Um, Robert Baratheon is hiding there, obviously. Um, and I think Rhaegar has, has a wing in there, too. If I recall, he's got, like, the new Xbox or whatever it was, and he's set up there, too. So if you guys have questions for any of those three people, um, or Nimble Dick, who's kind of always on the hunt, for monsters and such, um, then you guys can specify either a super chat or a PayPal for again, old man, Bobby B, Nimble Dick, or Rhaegar. And uh, and we just we could get an answer from one of those characters. So I'll just leave it at that and let you guys do the magic. Uh, that being said, let me check on this PayPal that just came in. Mm -hmm. It was from Ludmila. How much credence is there to the rumors that the crypts of Winterfell are connected with the lands north of the wall via underground tunnels? Aha! This is absolutely on our outline, of course. So yep. put a pin in that one, and we will get to that. We're get, we've got a whole section on that. Don't you worry. Mm -hmm. I was I tried to be as extensive with my notes as I could, try to cover as many angles as I could. Right. That's why I deleted about half of them. So <laughs> move right along. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I didn't do that. <laughs> I think maybe we whittled down two pages, went from 11 to nine. That was mostly, I just changed the font size. Oh, okay. Yeah, I actually didn't delete anything. I just changed the font size. <clears throat> <laughs> so guys, um, Rhaegar's harp, let's see here. Maybe down there, obviously. Now, of course, we know this whole promise me, Ned, is this line that's echoing in Ned's head. Leanna made him promise certain things. Obviously, the main thing 
would be to hide John's identity to keep him safe. That's the big crux of it. Ned lies and says that it's his bastard in order to protect his identity. It's a, it's a lie so personal that no one really challenges it. Specifically, Robert doesn't challenge it, and that's the main thing. Yep. But, of course, that promise could have come with other things, right, Tim? Yep. Like, when we think promise me, Ned, like, Ned definitely seems the type where it would have went without saying Ned was going to take care of this child no matter what, because it was his nephew and he loved his sister. And so I think the promise me, Ned, is more of a promise you will share with him his identity and promise me you'll have something to prove it. And again, promise me you'll keep him safe from Robert. Because even though Robert is Ned's best friend, we've seen that they've had two falling outs. And the first time that they fell out was because of the deaths of Rhaegar's children. And they didn't speak for a while and only reconciled after the war. So that was a pretty serious thing. And then there's a second falling out when Ned learns of the uh, assassination orders against Danny. But again, like these falling outs always are in regards to Robert's reaction to Targaryens and his efforts to eradicate Targaryens. Right. And that's clearly put in the story so that we can put this together and exactly. figure out what the reason would be to keep John's identity hidden. Even though Ned and Robert are best friends, we've seen Robert has a rage and a vengeful side. and He's pretty obsessed with killing Targaryens, you know, as a shout out to old new dude, by the way, who put out a video yesterday. He's got a pretty good Robert Baratheon, uh, Robert Baratheon impression going on. So check that out on old new dude's channel if you if you want to giggle. And also he's got a theory about uh, Gendry being trueborn because um, old new dude loves that tinfoil. <laughs> yes, he does. Hashtag old new dude solutions. Anyway, so we've got. um. Let's see here. We've we've made the point about Leanna being the only one without the sword. So I like that idea. She's welcoming, potentially welcoming John when every, all the other spirits are hostile. Um, so if you have now, there's two. There's two. Quite, let's let's split this in half because I've sort of muddied the waters here by saying, well, John, his dream is going down to the crypt. So let me ask you this, Tim. Do you think we're going to get both a dream sequence in the crypts and then actual people going down there to grab whatever physical object is there? Um, we kind of would have to if it was the harp, right? Yeah. Okay, so... Yeah, I can, I can see both happening. Because John is going to have to go down to the crypts eventually to find these things. Or the or other somebody idea... Will, yeah. Somebody will, yeah. Or the other idea is that Mance is down there and Mance might be the one to come up with these things and given hit Mance's relationship with John as a, a sort of surrogate father figure, which which John has had a couple of, along right. with Ned and Maester Eamon, um, he might be the one to present and just say, hey, you know, I found this, but dude, this is yours. You have to have this. Actually, Tim, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, the idea of John dreaming it and then going there to get it seems a little too like yeah, A and then B and then C. Mm -hmm. Um so the idea that that Mance is going to maybe find whatever the secret is while John will get a glimpse of it in a dream and then we'll be left to sort of piece it together. Uh, yeah. That makes a lot more sense to me. And like, so you we could have Mance uh, finding objects to present to John and then Howland Reed, when he finally pops up, having all this information to present to John. And then, of course, when Bran uh, returns back and he has all the information that he's downloaded from the Weirwood net, He's going to sell. Well, I also got a lot of things that, that you need to know, too. And so, so John this was um, we might I'm skipping ahead a little bit. There's a couple more points to make about the harp. But a related idea I have um, about what could be down there in general is some type of information, uh, because information is really the most powerful thing in the world. Uh, a, a new piece of information can completely change your course of action, whether it's true information or false information. And. Everything about the Tower of Joy and RLJ has been shrouded in secrecy. So John's obviously going to get information through his dream. Meaning that if he sees Leanna, the, the obvious thing he's going to come out of that dream with is a knowledge of who he is and his parentage. And maybe a little bit about why the secret had to be kept. But the main thing he needs to learn is who he is. Um, but the other thing is that Rhaegar was basically preparing for the war for the dawn 2.0 when he died 
that's what all this shit about the prince that was promised is about and the the comet he was prepping for the war against the others some people think house targaryen's been doing that since aegon came to dragonstone and that's that's a little bit of a separate theory but it's pretty certain i mean it is certain that that's what rhaegar was doing it's basically said that he read something in a book that changed his whole course and then the famous line is it seems i must be a warrior so obviously he thinks that he is seeing himself in some part of a fulfillment of a prophecy that he's read. It may only be to birth the chosen ones, but he, at that point, I bet he probably thought he was Azor High Reborn. And I'm guessing that later he maybe came to think that it was his children. But the point is he read something, it changed his course of action, and that something had to do with prophecy. So Tim, could it be that part of the thing or the thing in the crypts would actually be a book a book of prophecy one of the books that Rhaegar was reading because mm -hmm. if john if if Rhaegar is prepping for the new long night wouldn't he want his son john to know why he's important not just yeah. that he's Rhaegar's son but here's what we're facing kid you know yeah i i, I can see that uh Rhaegar placing whatever book or scroll it is that made him have his whole change of character down there and saying like this is what you need to read i also think that what Rhaegar read may have also been the thing that Eris the first read because before Rhaegar read what it is he did and showed up on the courtyard saying I need to be a warrior he had been compared to Eris the first who was said that he would sooner take a book to bed than his own wife and we know yeah, that or, and Daron as well there's a bookish Targaryen sort of archetype that Aenys and a few others yeah but the thing with Eris the first is that he never had children and some people have chalk this up to maybe he was a homosexual maybe he was asexual part of me thinks maybe he real from what he read he realized i'm not going to be the one that fathers the prince that was promised so i need to manipulate things because we see this with blood raven too and him and blood raven were close blood raven was he eris was the first hand of the kid the first uh king that blood raven was hand for Correct, so yeah eris may have also been playing a part in this whole uh, like trimming the family tree, we say with Blood Raven, that ensured that Makar got the throne, which then led to Aegon, Aeg, Aegon the Fifth, getting the throne when he marries uh, a Blackwood, and then we get our three generations of incest. And that's an and and I was thinking kind of along the same lines when I was thinking about Rhaegar and his intentions. He was communicating with Maester Aemon. And potentially even Blood Raven, if Blood Raven was visiting him in dreams or something like that. But certainly he was comparing notes with Maester Aemon. And Aemon is another guy who's interested in prophecy, you know, knew, Ray, knew uh, Blood Raven to some extent, although he was a good bit younger at that point. So <clears throat> Rhaegar's, Rhaegar has his eyes turned north, is the point. And so whatever's in the crypts, it's going to be about RLJ. But there's a strong chance that it could have it could be something that helps prepare John for the new long night. So if, if there was a book of prophecy, that would make sense. Um, Maester Aemon was trying to give John Colloquo Votar's Jade Compendium before uh, he left. So it would kind of make sense if Rhaegar is also trying to feed him some book or, or, or a thing about prophecy. And it's also quintessential Rhaegar if there's like a harp and a book. Mm -hmm. It's like, come on, have a seat. <laughs> read some poetry <laughs> sing a song it's like very Rhaegar, you know yep and if it is the harp and a book that also is again another contrast to Fagon, who's going to be showing up with a sword and ah. this is this harkens back to these blackfire rebellions of hmm. our bookish king versus our warrior king okay you have if a guy's showing up well i got a harp and a book and another one's showing up well i have a sword and then you, and then it's left to the lords and their different ideas of well, what makes a king decide? Well, who's going to be the one that we choose? And it comes back to this idea of like red or black, a dragon is still a dragon. Well, which one to us? Which one of these two is the better dragon? Well, the the jokes on them if they think that John's the bookish type uh, because that <laughs> exactly. boy's nasty. Exactly. And when he comes back, he's only going to be that much more of an Ulf Hednar mm -hmm. berserker warrior. So. I, I that is an interesting point though the dichotomy of the symbols there um so we'll see uh i i'm definitely looking forward to the whole 
Danny coming to Westeros, interacting with Fagon, and then interacting with John, and seeing how how George weaves all that. Uh, so the other it, the complement to the idea of a book of prophecy that could be there to help John prepare for the new war for the dawn would be a magic sword, and this I would call more tinfoil because I think the magic sword that John needs is probably Dawn, mm -hmm. which is probably Lightbringer, the dragon steel of the last hero, and 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 Lightbringer for all intents and purposes. But the the reason why I think there could still be a sword in there is because, of course, if you guys have watched the Nightbringer series or just my channel in general, you know that there's seen that I think Bloodstone Emperor made a sword with his black meteorite, and that it's very possible we had two Lightbringer swords, a black and a white. You have Dawn, the white sword made from a meteorite, but also a black sword. And so the original Azor Ahai Lightbringer, the one that was used to murder Nissa Nissa in blood magic or whatever, that may be a black sword, like a prototype of Valerian steel. If that's the case, and that's been that was one of my first theories that there that that there was two swords and that there's a black one hiding somewhere. So the question then becomes, well, where's the black sword hiding? And there's only a couple possibilities. Um, at first, I thought Ned's Ice, because it's sort of the most important sword to the story. It's the one that we see first and we kind of care about. Yes, obviously, it's said that it comes from Valeria 400 years, old, years ago. So that would have to be a lie and a cover story or something like that. Um, so I, I call that unlikely. Blackfire is a little bit more likely because it's an ancestral sword of the Targaryens. They could have brought it from Valyria. So it could be, we don't know how old that sword is. That could be friggin' Azor a high sword for all we know. Um, the other possibility is just we haven't seen it. And if we mm. haven't seen it, where would it be? It would be in the crypts um, because that would have been potentially either a sword of the last hero or something the last hero took from the dead hands of the Night King or something like that. Um, so the crypts would be a logical place for it to be final clue about this. And this maybe is how I started onto this is the Kings of winter have swords on their laps. Now they're made of iron, which means that they're originally black swords, but then they rust and turn red and then they leave red stains. So you have a black sword turning into a red sword. That's just what Ned's ice did. It was a black Valerian steel sword that got dyed red and black. And red swords are obviously associated with Lightbringer. So why are these kings of winter down here with black swords or red swords, however you want to look at it? Um, mm -hmm. That to me looks like Lightbringer sitting on the lap of the last hero. Um, so maybe there's a magic sword down there of some kind. Um, and again, I consider this to be a lot less likely than a harp or a book of prophecy or something. But I just want to throw it out there because uh, it's not impossible. It could be down there. And it would be a huge bomb drop if there was a friggin some sort of unholy black weapon down there that would just be awesome yeah but uh when it comes to the swords specifically the iron swords that are across the laps of the stark lords um i think it has to do with we're, we're told that the others don't like iron and when we think of like the kings of winter in life when they wear their crowns they're made of bronze but they also have these iron spikes and i think that has to do with the blood of the other this idea that the Starks do that from an ancient line of Starks going back as far as we can, going back to the Knight's King, that the Starks do have a residual amount of other blood in them from Knight's Queen and Knight's King. And I see this iron as tempering that blood of the other. You wear your crown in life and that tempers your blood while you're living. And then in death, they have the swords laid across their lap to temper the blood in death. And I see this as like a precaution of them uh to prevent the if the others ever show up again which is happening as like a fail safe of well at least this way they won't raise the starks the it's like like if you think like supernatural it's like the salt circle keeping the ghosts away the For iron sure. the iron is what's keeping the others from being able to raise at least these particular bodies from the ground yeah and it complements the the knight's watch who are swords in the darkness but also the shield that guards the realm of men um, against the others so the the starks and the night's watch always kind of overlap and have parallel symbolism um not inverted parallel but just basically matching symbolism in, in essence so uh, the king of winter crown is made of bronze and iron and 
it's said that it's those two metals are dark and strong to fight the cold. So I tend to think this is more of a thematic thing and a folkloric thing as opposed to the crown is literally having an effect on the Starks. But I do think that thematically you're you're right on the money as far as like the Starks have the blood of the other in them and yet they fight the others. Just as Nimble Dick lay with a squisher woman and yet hunts the squishers. It's a sort of self-loathing thing. As Did you watch the stream uh, on Sunday, Tim? Or Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah I did. Okay, very, I just want to hear on the jokes here. Oh, yeah, yep. All right. No, but seriously, though, you, it is it is true. And um, there's a saying from one of the Garth kings in the Reach about, you know, taking one of the wolves and training it to guard the flock. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what the Starks are. And I talk about the good other archetype, this child that was stolen from the others that has other blood, but fights for the sign of the living. That is the wolf that's been turned into the guard dog. That's the Stark wolf. That's who they mm -hmm. are. So thematically, that's all very copacetic there as far as the, the swords and the warding and the associations of the metals used down there. So, um, <clears throat> the other thing about the Starks, besides having the red and black swords, which remind me of Azor High, is that their wolves are always fiery. I mentioned that Cerberus is a hellhound, and you know the, the dire wolves take after Cerberus, but literally the descriptions of their eyes are always fiery, molten gold, on fire, glowing. And then the couple of times we see them in dream form, it's even worse. Theon has the dream of the two wolves with the heads of children, and they stink of sulfur and brimstone and hell. And there's the uh, Theon also dreams of Rob and Grey Wind walking into w Winterfell with burning eyes and bleeding wounds. Um, so everything about the wolves is hellhound symbolism. There's nothing cold about the wolves at all. So um, it's weird. The Starks are actually, we think about them as ice people, but they're really like this little bastion of warmth holding mm -hmm. out against the cold. Um, and in some cases, they're kind of using the cold to fight the cold. That's the idea of them having a sword called ice or something like that, or using obsidian to kill the others when obsidian is frozen fire. So we're using frozen weapons to kill the others. But they sit on a hot springs, which literally is a bulwark of warmth in the cold. And their symbolism sort of duplicates that. They have hellhounds. They have a lot of sneaky, fiery symbolism. Ned carries around a dragon sword but they're they're isolated amongst the cold. So um John's John's hidden dragon nature is basically I see it as a completion of that. Okay? So John is this hidden dragon inside of Winterfell. Or you might say he's a frozen dragon because he's he's the son of a dragon given to the north. Um and his name is Snow, but he's a secret dragon under the snow or whatever. That's that's basically the same as Winterfell. There's secret fire symbolism hiding under the ice. Yeah. Um, and the Winterfell dragon, quote unquote, the one that uh, Bran sees, you know, the 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 serpent whose roar was a rhythm of flame that he that he sees through Summer's eyes when Winterfell is burning. <clears throat> I probably not a real dragon, but definitely a symbolic depiction of fiery resurrected John <sighs> emerging mm -hmm. from the crypts of Winterfell, in the sense that his identity will be reborn from the crypts, right? Once yeah. he learns his identity there. Yep. I also think um, if we're also going to go a literal sense of what is it that Bran was seeing through Summer's eyes. Because when we have these passages where Bran is in Summer, he's describing things the way a wolf would describe them from a wolf's perception of what this is. So for me, I think what, what Bran was describing or what Summer uh, was describing was the Red Comet. And you think of like, well, how, how would a, a wolf or a dog uh, describe this? Like, I have a dog. I pull out my vacuum. My dog, I know what the vacuum does, but the dog thinks it's some kind of monster. Uh, so when Summer is staring up, because Summer stares up when it's describing this. So it might be seeing the comet, and that is what it feels. That's the best way uh, a wolf can interpret what this thing is. Oh, it's a fiery, it's a snake in the sky. And it still amounts to the same thing, which is that George wants us to perceive the symbol of a dragon emerging from Winterfell when it's cracked open. Yep. And that's exactly what's going to happen as far as John being reborn. And it could even be literal, uh, Grey Waste Tim, 
one of my uh, the others will steal John's body's ideas is that they'll steal his body and that's what they need to break the wall is that, uh, you know, Jon Snow, the stolen other baby or the blood of the dragon turned into a new Night King, that he will be able to break the enchantment of the wall. Because every scene that talks about the wall falling or being the end of the world is either a John chapter or it's tied to John. Like, and frequently it's John's resurrection symbolism that goes hand in hand with the destruction of the wall. Um, the wall is in many cases almost portrayed as an icy shell that John's going to hatch out of in a sense. Mm -hmm. So I believe that it is very possible. The others will steal John's body, break through the wall and that John will remain otherized all the way to Winterfell because he was getting ready to attack Winterfell before he died. So it may be that he'll essentially do the same thing when he wakes up, except for that he'll be under the control of the others. And it may not be until Winterfell that the spell is broken and his body stolen back after some sort of battle. And if that's the case, then Fire White John literally will be reborn at Winterfell. He will be a dragon emerging from the, the, the crypts in the middle of a great battle and a conflagration or something like that. So it could be symbolic, but it could actually go to that literal of a level where John's freeing from enchantment happens at Winterfell. Mm -hmm. What do you think of that? Great waste, Tim. I do like it. And the idea, because if John is otherized, then we will see like a scramble at the wall. If John escapes the wall and starts making his way down towards Winterfell, then there's going to have to be uh, people that go after him. And that could be what leads Mel down. And that could be what leads uh, like that could that could also have something to do with how Stannis's uh, war goes. And because the thing with Stannis is Stannis is uh, we have John as a Knights King figure, but we also have all these other Knights King figures too. Stannis is one of them. Uh, Ramsey to an extent is one of them. Euron definitely is one of them. And so that's why I think that John would only temporarily be otherwise. Cause I feel that Euron's going to have to take the uh, role of Knights King more. And I'm yeah. totally on board with the, John, once he gets an idea of who he is, and I think he's going when Danny comes and the drag and the dragons are there, he's more than likely going to ride Rhaegal. Uh, Viserion, with all of its ice dragon imagery, it's probably going to be the one to be stolen by Euron, and we'll get our battle over the God's Eye too. A uh, John playing the role of Damon and Euron being Aemon One Eye. This uh, this does seem to be foreshadowed. Um... And that's one of the ones where I just don't I don't see how we don't get something like that. Like no, that we, dragon needs... fight is so epic. It has all the best. It's the best symbolism dragon fight. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, we got to see something like that. Um, and here's the other thing. Okay, so I've talked a lot about on this channel, of course, about how how Danny, how her arc will wrap up compared to what we saw on the show. I of course am firmly in the camp that Danny is a heroic character first and foremost, and that ultimately her story will end with heroic self-sacrifice defeating the others. Now thing is I do expect her to try to take King's landing. Mm -hmm. I do expect there to be a lot of casualties uh, prop potentially the wildfire getting set off makes too much sense because it's a visual depiction of her confronting the legacy of her father, which is something George has obviously delayed in Danny's arc. She's, he's totally held it off, that reckoning. It's obviously coming for her. So she very likely will be perceived negatively by a lot of Westeros. Vagon will be popular. We know that because the Mummer's Dragon is cheered by the crowds in Danny's vision. Fagon is the Mummer's Dragon. He's set up to replace Cersei, who's very unpopular. So Fagon will be popular. Danny's going to run against that when she gets there. She very likely will be viewed negatively. And especially if she fights Fagon and there's a lot of casualties, she'll be the Mad Queen's daughter. So if John becomes otherized and attacks Winterfell with the others, kind of makes them a match, doesn't it? <laughs> as far as both of them having terrible reputations, but actually being heroic characters who the fate of the story is going to come down upon. And no one may ever even really know how heroic they really were. Um, unless Brand, I guess, gets the word out and tells everyone maybe at the end or something. But I, I really think that George loves that idea of kind of like Elric or 
just these anti-hero characters who have bad reputations and are kind of mixed bags, but in the end will do the right thing. Um, so that's what I was thinking of as we were talking about John. I was like, oh, this kind of matches the way Danny's reputation may be soiled, at least for a time. And like to harp on just to kind of pimp my own essay, the Fagon, a parallel of Prince of Kings, Princes and Pretenders. Uh, Fagon does match the, he matches so well with so many of other Targaryen Kings. And we see like a lot of this in the way he's going to take King's Landing. Cause first he has to defeat Cersei. That's going to make him a Jaehaerys, the conciliator figure to Cersei's mate, uh, Magor the Cruel. And then there, I'm also on board with the idea of Fagon's death. He's will he'll be eaten by a dragon. Well, that makes uh, Fagon and Danny an inverse of uh, Aegon the Second and Rhaenyra. Right. Uh, yeah. And it's there, there's just so there's so many parallels that Fagon fits when it comes to different Targaryen kings. That that I just it at least one of them has to one of them has to happen. <laughs> Uh, and we also do know that Danny, that there, all of these caches of of wildfire, it's act, it's way more extensive than what because even even what Tyrion finds from uh, from the pyromancers, it's not all they have. Like we know that uh, the Mad King stashed pots of it everywhere, and so I do see like if there if King's Landing goes up in flames. It might be caused by Dane, but it's going to be completely accidental. But how, but all that, what matters in these situations is, well, it's the optics of the people. What did they see? They saw her burn King's Landing. It doesn't matter if it right. was accidentally that she didn't know that there was wildfire stash. All that matters is what they see in the moment of it happening. Yeah, and John Khan is the wild card. He's the match that's set to spark any fire that's nearby. He's down to his last few time on earth. He's desperate. He's angry. He's bitter. Um, and, he and, and Fagon is also, I'll point out, sort of moving out of his power to control. And so John Con very well could take matters into his own hands without Fagon's knowing at any point and do something extreme that he thinks is necessary in the role of this example of Tywins that he's sort of chasing after. Yeah, because John Con laments the fact that he didn't use scorched earth tactics the way Tywin did. I occasionally have cockatoo business and things to attend to here. So if you ever see me just dip off the camera, just uh, keep talking, buddy. Okay. <laughs> um, so I feel, do we want to continue on to the next idea of what might be down there? Or did you have Well, so let's save? stop real quick. Um, mm -hmm. You pulled a couple of nice quotes about the harp that I feel are worth reading. You've got one here about the power of harps that Littlefinger says, which is instructive since Littlefinger helped create the entire War for the Five uh, of the um, Roberts Rebellion confusion mess. Oh, but um, just... why don't you read that one as well as the one about John's recurring dream? It'll just sort of punctuate uh, what we've been talking about. These are good quotes, and I'm glad you pulled them. Okay, for, okay. So this is from little. This is Littlefinger, and this is from Sansa Six and A Storm of Swords. I also planted the notion of Sir Loras taking the white. Not that I suggested it; that would have been too crude. But men in my party supplied grisly tales about how the mob that killed Sir Preston Greenfield and raped Lady Lawless, and slipped a few silvers to Lord Tyrell's army of singers to sing of Ad R Ryan Redwine, Serwin of the Mere Shield, and Prince Aemon the Dragon Knight. A harp can be as dangerous as a sword in the right hands. And then in John's dream, this is John 4 from A Game of Thrones, I start to run then, throwing open doors, climbing the tower three steps at a time, screaming for someone, for anyone. And then I find myself in front of the door to the crypts. It's black inside, and I can see the steps spiraling down. Somehow I know I have to go down there, but I don't want to. I'm afraid of what might be waiting for me. The old kings of winter are down there, sitting on their thrones and stone wolves at their feet and iron swords across their lap. But it's not them I'm afraid of. I scream that I'm not a Stark, that this isn't my place, but it's no good. I have to go anyway. So I start down feeling the walls as I descend with no torch to light the way, 
it gets darker and darker until I want to scream. That's when I always wake. And then there is one more. Uh, this is John talking to Sam. Uh, Samwell for Storm of Swords. All my dreams are of the crypts of the stone kings on their thrones. Sometime I hear Rob's voice and my father's as if they were at a feast. But there's a wall between us, and I know that no place has been set for me. So this is a great example of how, like I was saying at the beginning, George is, all, is very disciplined about tying everything back to the characters' hearts in conflict. There's no bit of symbolism or lore or world building or anything that isn't made use of to enhance the themes of the characters and their struggles. And this is a perfect example. We're sitting here talking about all the fun, mysterious things that are in the crypts. But first and foremost, this is an emotional destination for John. His feelings of alienation play right into his identity. Who is he? Who does he belong to? Um, we have yet to see how he's going to reconcile that. But of course, he needs to understand who he is to be able to do that. Um, and reconciling yourself to your dark side or your shadow in the Jungian sense is obviously a big part of this story because we literally have these shadows that have been sort of split off from the rest of Westeros in the others. And the others are parallel, the wildlings who are the otherized humans, you know, so George is making a commentary on tribalism and, you know, turning a, a different group of people into the other. That's the reason why the others are called the others. That's what they represent. Um, and I've talked about how the Night's Watch and the others are very much like two sides of the same coin. And they go back to some sort of magical bifurcation or something like that. So <clears throat> when we're talking about character transformations, reconciling themselves to their shadow selves is, is something that George is thinking about and dealing with. And just to speak more broadly, identity is, is a big theme. We see these characters change their names like Elaine and Sansa. We have even to the point where George names their chapters different names or even, you know, the Turncloak, the ghost in Winterfell. Um, he's, he's, he's ha he has the characters subsume their identity literally and figuratively and rediscover it. So this is a perfect example of that. All his dreams are of the crypts. He hears Rob's voice and his father's as if they were at a feast but there's a wall between us and he knows this is almost like John talking to a psychologist. He's like, I know that there's no place been set for me. He doesn't see it, but it's just something that he knows based on the feel of the dream. So it's very much John himself feels otherized mm -hmm. from almost everyone. Uh, so that's uh, yeah. Great quotes. And it, again, pretty obvious that John at some point will finish this dream. And one would assume this will happen while he's dead. And also, when we talk of characters changing their identity and changing their name, one thing that is going to happen with John when he does find out his lineage is it also might come with the knowledge of knowing what it is his father actually named it. Because Ned named him John, and it's obviously after John Aaron. But what is it that uh, that Rhaegar named him? And I don't think it, it can't be Aegon. There's no way that Rhaegar is going to name, even if they have different mothers, I don't think a Rhaegar is going to name two of his sons Aegon. It seems but silly. But when we look at that little finger quote, when he starts naming the historical figures that he's bribing the singers to sing about, the last name he says right before he says a harp could be more dangerous than a sword is Aemon the Dragon Knight. And I think that's just another little tidbit that says that John's real name may be Aemon. And you couple with that with the fact that of all the Targaryen kings, we've never had a Targaryen king named Aemon. All the Prince Aemons that were in line to the throne died before they could actually get there. Mm. That's cool because John's not going to sit the throne either, so that would kind of make sense. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I've always liked that idea that Aemon the Dragon Knight will be, you know, because uh, that's the one John emulates, and that, and that Aemon would be his name because Aemon the Dragon Knight is who he emulates most often when they're talking about you know, oh, me and Rob would call ourselves great heroes and chase each other around the castle. And also, and he, Aemon the Dragon Knight is, um, he is a symbolic good other in that he is a dragon person who's wearing the white shadow snowy armor of the Kingsguard. So he's showing you the same thing that John is, a dragon hidden, hidden under the snow, hidden inside a snowy identity is this dragon person. So I like it a lot. And obviously... 
it makes sense emotionally too because john has a big soft spot for maester aemon who is a targaryen so this might be a way for john to accept being a targaryen because obviously he's going to think of the mad king yep and he's like and oh fuck great i'm related to him you know uh so thinking about also maester means, aemon being named yeah. aemon that might help john a little bit and, it makes and that's and that's the idea of taking the good and bad with family because yeah you're related to the mad king but you're also related to Maester Aemon. But the same can be said for Starks because sometimes I think we look at the Stark family through like these like rose colored glasses when the reality is, is like, no, there have been some just as bad Starks. And if we look back in Stark history, they've had, they've committed some atrocities. Like it is called the rape of the three sisters when they tried before the veil took over that. So and there, I believe there was one called Brandon the Bad is one of the statues that's mentioned down there. We don't know why he's the bad, but to earn that name, you had to have done something. Yeah, you don't you don't keep power in a region for 8,000 years without, um, you know, cracking yep. a few eggs, if you will. And there's certainly a few great houses that have disappeared uh, in the north as well. So there's no doubt the Starks are no better or worse than anybody else. Um, and I think that's true of every house. Like mm -hmm. people try to pass judgment on House Targaryen, but there's plenty of good Targaryens and really only a few of them are mad. So I think George in the end is just showing us that people from any corner of the world are going to have some good and bad folks. And yep. Shades of I was just talking to my friend how this is true in, in political groups and fandoms. It doesn't matter how noble the cause or purpose a group is organized around. Any group is going to create power structure Power structure is going to attract people who like power for power's sake. It always happens. Um, so, yeah, that's the thing. I just, I really hope John's not going around saying, I don't want it. I'm sorry, say again, Tim. <laughs> that John doesn't spend all of his later chapters saying, I don't want it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, we don't talk about the show too much on here, but, mm -hmm. you know, Right after the season, I did do a rewatch specifically looking at the John dialogue because his dialogue trailed off so much in the last season that it was really noticeable. Like he has all these scenes with Daenerys where you're waiting for him to say fucking anything mm -hmm. and he just stands there. And it's just so hard to watch. You go back only two seasons to season six and John is running his friggin' mouth everywhere, long speeches, this and that. And then all of a sudden he's this stoic, statue in season eight it's really absurd um so yeah what were we talking about that's why i don't bring up season eight <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so john will be uh well so let me go back to information so information is something that, that ties together john and danny here danny needs to know primarily about Azor Ahai, the long night and shit like that. Like Quaid is the one feeding Danny information cryptically and drips and drabs. And there's this idea that Danny needs to go to a shy to learn truth, whether that be by glass candle or dream or something like that. So basically what we have is, and I think about this when I think about Rhaegar, Rhaegar was trying to get organized for the war for the dawn. He pictured himself raising the three children who would fight this war and at some point gaining the dragons back, but basically like teaching them, training them in the yard. Think about that scene that Danny sees in the House of the Undying, where he's Rhaegar is sitting there with Elia and their two children. And he's like, there must be one more. This is a guy, again, who's planning on having three kids mm -hmm. who are the chosen warriors that he's going to spend 20 years prepping for the War for the Dawn. Instead, he dies. And his kids are scattered to the wind and they're growing up isolated and with no knowledge of what's coming or very little. So this is what George has done. He's made somebody have a really good plan and then he smashed it with Robert's hammer and he's created an interesting story out of the fragments. And so John and Danny are these lost scions of House Targaryen and really lost scions of like the great empire of the dawn and Azor Ahai because that's the whole purpose of them being Azor Ahai reborn. They have to deal with the legacy of these War for the Dawn events. And so we have Danny getting information from Quave, from Ashai, from Glass Candle usage or whatever. John has gotten a little bit from Mel and from Eamon. Um, 
but the idea that there's going to be more information in the crypts uh, from Rhaegar himself, it was just, it makes a lot of sense to me. And um, and it's a good parallel between John and Danny, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, but getting back to the outline, let's talk about dragon eggs. All right. So dragon eggs. Um, so in fire and blood, uh, Jacaris, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to say Jace because I always feel like I'm pronouncing that wrong. But Jace Valerion uh, travels to the north and he, in order to get Cregan Stark on the side. And while he is there, he supposedly marries Cregan's bastard sister, Sarah Snow. And we know that dragons don't like the cold. So while he's there, his dragon Vermax is sheltering in the crypts of Winterfell where uh, along the heated walls where the hot springs flow. And according to the testimony of Mushroom, he, uh, Vermax laid a clutch of eggs. But we never hear like what happens to these eggs once Jace leaves and maybe they were left down there. Uh, with Jace's, with the pact of ice and fire that Jace signs with Cregan Stark, the terms are that Jace's first daughter will marry the son of Cregan, of Cregan Stark. But it's also possible that maybe a more another term into this might have been also, you're going to leave behind these dragon eggs that were laid. And it makes sense. It would make too much sense if I could just jump in real quick. It, it makes perfect sense as like a sign of commitment to the pack, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And another thing about Jace is Jace is also another one of these uh, figures of a song of ice and fire because his mother is a Targaryen and his father, even though his last name is Valerian, his father is Harwin Strong. So he has first men and Valerian blood in him. Um, and so that, so, so he, so he is like another, uh, again, he's another ice and fire parallel, which is uh, something we get, we don't get again until we get to uh, Aegon V when he marries a Blackwood and ends up having his children that then lead to Rhaegar's birth. I'm um, cautiously, <clears throat> uh, I think Cleo might want to attack my hat. And so I'm, <laughs> I can't put her on my shoulder as I normally do. Uh, or at least it might be funny if she does. I'm just waiting to see uh, how this is going to go. Hi, good girl. Do you want to be on my shoulder? Or is the hat too much like a furry animal? Well, maybe it's all right. Okay. All right, let's proceed. So dragon eggs, not only does it make sense with the plot, as far as if there was such a pact, it totally makes sense that they would leave them there as a sign of like, okay, we care about this. We're coming back for this. We're invested in this. And these eggs would obviously be the birthright of that child. Now, the pact was never consummated, but it's easy to see. There we go. Rhaegar and Lyanna as a sort of eventual fulfillment of the pact, right? So yeah. then Jon Snow would end up being that child and his birthright would be those dragon eggs. So then that makes even more sense for the eggs to be down there. Um, it's a, not only a sign of just dragons and shit like that and mm -hmm. consistent with all the hidden dragon symbolism, John himself, you could say, is like a dragon waiting to hatch from the stone egg of the crypts, right? Um, yeah. But, but it really does make sense if you look at that pact of ice and fire. Why would George put that in fire and blood if not to act as even more foreshadowing for RLJ. Um, and the variation of this idea that you have in here is that perhaps um, Rhaegar, would, there would have been an egg at the Tower of Joy that Rhaegar got from Dragonstone yeah. to give John to as his birthright, and that that egg would then be in the crypts uh, in, in Lyanna's tomb, right? Yeah, yeah, the Targaryen tradition of placing a dragon egg in the baby's cradle, and if Rhaegar didn't make it back, then it would make sense that he would still want the egg to be taken care of. And it's possible that the egg might also be in Leon's tomb with the harp, which is also another uh, way of phrasing a dragon waking from stone if the dragon egg is underneath the stone statue. That's cool. I dig that. Um, and then it almost becomes like uh, like Leanne is a penguin, um, you know, <laughs> with the egg under her feet. And she's gardening. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> but no, seriously, though, Leanna is obviously John's mother, uh, John being a dragon. So if there's a dragon egg like under her statue, it's like a very literal depiction 
of what's going on here. So that makes sense. And obviously the answer could be a combination of these things. Um, like I think the book of the prophecy, the more I think about it, the harder it is for me to believe that there isn't a book down there. Like it's Rhaegar. Like, yeah. of course he would have wanted to send information. I think um, maybe there's just a whole bunch of gifts from his parents waiting for him down there. Like, and that's the thing. One of the things I was do when I was writing these notes is the idea of, it might not just be one thing. There could be multiple things down that are waiting down in the crypts. Definitely. And that's kind of what I'm saying. Um, it, it wouldn't, these things are all of a piece. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, so there's a question of in my mind of how much how much is Ned doing? How much would Ned be willing to participate in? Um like Ned was willing for was going to tell John who he was after he went to the wall and took his oath. So Ned is obviously not planning on trying to create a Targaryen restoration. Mm -hmm. Um so I just I wonder how much stuff he, that he would take like the harp is believable because it's like uh it's just a proof of who he is it's a personal thing not necessarily something that you'd use to start a targaryen restoration um that, that's not the only obvious purpose of it uh but yeah that that really is a question to me like um ned's understanding of of rhaegar like Mm -hmm. Did he understand what Rhaegar believed about prophecy? And no, I don't think he did because Ned had kept the secret for years. And it wasn't until John had made the decision to join the Night's Watch that the idea came upon Ned to Ned that like, oh, okay, well, this is going to be the perfect time to tell you who you really are because you're going to be renouncing all claims when you take your vows. No, that definitely makes sense because then it's safer to tell him. Um, but Leanna had an opportunity to share information with Ned before she died. Mm -hmm. So one of the things Ned's going to be wondering is like, why the hell did Rhaegar put these Kingsguard out in front of the tower to keep us apart? Why is like, what the, what the F, you know? Yeah. Um, so like, it's very possible that Leanne, one of the few things Leanna might've said with her dying breath was that Rhaegar believed, that, you know, John, he's important, Ned. He's the prince that was promised. There's the darkness coming. The others are coming. And he's the one. And uh, so, like, it could be something that Ned didn't believe fully or just put in the back of his mind. Um, but what if, what if, for example, the prophecy dictates something about the Night's Watch? What if, what if Rhaegar, what if part of the intention was for John to join the Watch? What if Leanna's part of her promise was like, I want him to join the Watch? Like, that's what he has to do. I don't, I'm not saying that's likely, but we don't know what kinds of things were in the prophecy. And a mention of the Night's Watch is certainly not crazy because they were the ones involved in the original War for the Dawn. So if, if Rhaegar is reading prophecy and he believes that his children need to fight the others, the idea that Jon was supposed to join the Watch kind of, kind of could fit with that. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, spitballing here, but... Yeah. <clears throat> but one thing we do see is that Ned... When it comes to Liana, Ned did have a habit of kind of looking the other way because Liana also, like earlier in life, Liana had voiced her concerns to Ned about marrying Robert Baratheon when he had told her what he told him. Robert's not going to be faithful. It doesn't matter what he says about how much he loves me. And that's the thing, too, because I think Liana had the uh, she had the self-awareness to know that Robert didn't truly love her. He loved the idea of her. Just same thing with Cersei. Right. Cersei didn't really love Rhaegar. Cersei loved the idea of Rhaegar. What we have here are these people who are saying, oh, things would have been perfect if I married this person. And the reality is, is no. It's like uh, Robert still would have been out gallivanting around with other women, even if he married Lyanna. And Cersei still would have been shacking up with Jaime, even if she married Rhaegar. Like, it doesn't change that that's the type of people that they are. So I do think that Liana having, if there was a promise that Liana made to have Ned, uh, have John join the Night's Watch, it could be more running it with this idea of you need to protect John, you need to protect this this boy from Robert. It doesn't matter that he's your best friend, and and it might not have been until Ned actually made it to King's Landing and saw the bodies of Ray and saw Rhaegar's dead children that it really dawned on him that. This guy wants Targaryens dead. 
And that might include killing my own family who has Targaryen blood in him. Yeah, so Ned's Ned's definitely um, in a pretty tough position here. Uh, no matter what is the case, like in, he's being pitted against his friend and against the king, sort of by Rhaegar and Lyanna and Jon's existence. So there, the thing is, Ned is dead, and we'll never know what he knew. Um, so really, we're down to people like Howland Reed, uh, Sir Barristan may know some of the truth of these events uh, and obviously brand and the weirwood net. Uh, so there's really very limited avenues of revelation for the truth about RLJ, which is why I think that John probably will find out from Leanna in a dream and, and why um, people are looking for symbols of legitimacy because there just isn't much proof. There's not many people that would be able to say, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. This lines up. Um, so they're going to need some hard evidence for sure. And the harp really makes the most sense. The dragon's eggs, though, the dragon's eggs are a very powerful symbol of Targaryens um, it, it, to the point where they they maintained, uh, even after they couldn't hatch them, they still remained to be an important symbol. So I like this idea. And again, it complements um, the symbolism that's going on, uh, kind of, it it George loves to add that practical pra layer of practicality to everything. So it's like, well, the dragon went down there because it's warm and it's like a cave. And so he laid eggs. It's like very practical. Um, so I dig it. And there's also uh, an even older folkloric belief amongst the people of the winter town of Winterfell that there's a dragon down there heating the hot springs. And it's only presented as like the silliest belief, but George is just hitting us again and again with this idea that there's dragons down there. So obviously John's identity is the major dragon, but dragon eggs could make sense. Um, and the last point I'll make about this, Tim, is that I think of, I've often said that I think a no magic ending makes sense where the dragons and the others are both gone at the end of the story. But George's romantic side may want to leave us a little clue that maybe magic will come back one day. Yeah, I don't think uh, he and wants a dragon's egg would be a good way to do that, right? Yeah, I don't think he wants to completely shut that door. He wants to leave it slightly ajar. Right. And a dragon's egg would kind of be the perfect way to do that. Yeah. Because as long as it's sitting there, it could hatch, right? It's it's that horror movie hand popping out of the grave at the very end. It's like, uh oh, here we go again. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> good call. All right. So let's see here. Is there any other egg point? I think we got all the eggs here, didn't we? Egg points, I think we're good on. Oh, yeah, gosh. That e even, um, uh, what was I going to say? Um, you know, eventually George is going to bring egg from Duncan Egg to Winterfell as well. Yep. And that's another one where we're going to see probably more symbolism about John and dragons at Winterfell and stuff like that. But, Neither here nor there. We just said egg a bunch of times, and that's what I thought of. Uh, I hope we get a good another good Duncan egg. I think that um, George uses things like Duncan egg, just if I may, just give people my own thoughts on this, to uh, to help break up the immensity of the task of doing something like Winds of Winter. Everyone bitches about George like doing side projects and stuff, but like. Everyone's creative process is different. And for me, when I have a big job, I frequently take breaks from my big job by doing smaller jobs and come back mm -hmm. to the big job. That helps keep me fresher. So I think that we will, like, after, I think Winds of Winter is obviously going to be the next book he puts out. But I do think we'll get another Duncan Egg book um, before Dream of Spring. Oh, yeah, yeah. Know, and that he'll keep, he'll keep mixing those in because they're fun and easy for him to write. And same for Fire and Blood. And I think that helps break up um, just, again, the immensity of the task of ending such a big story. Plus, uh, when The Winds of Winter drops, it's probably going to be like the darkest story. There, we have so many things converging. We're starting with, bat with the Battle of Fire, the Battle of Ice. We got corpses being launched with trebuchets. So I see a Duncan Egg novella following that because we're going to need the levity. After, after what we Good get point. in T-Wow. That's, that's actually a great point. 
A very good point. Um, all right, cool. So we're going to go deeper into the tinfoil here. Mm -hmm. And, uh, oh, you know, one actual last point on the dragons. I do believe that it's not specifically said, but I do believe that Rhaegar believed that the dragons would come again. Everyone that's concerned about Azor High and the Long Night. I mean, the, the dragons returning are part of that prophecy any way you slice it. So it's hard to believe that Rhaegar didn't, like all the Targaryens since they lost dragons, believe that he would get the dragons back. Um, so this is another way the eggs would come into play. Like if he sent eggs north with Lyanna from the Tower of Joy, or if there already were eggs in there, eggs could be part of the prophecy. He might be aware of the eggs from the Pact of Ice and Fire that Vermax left. Um, there could be eggs waiting for John on Dragonstone or some other place, even like Rhaegar, essentially what I'm saying is he may very well have, or probably did think that somewhere dragon eggs would hatch for his children. And so he may very well have secreted away some or have laid that into his plans. That That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, but that also plays into, because I've, I've said that Targaryens, uh, they tend to have these delusions of grandeur. And when we talk about Rhaegar and how the tra how how emo he is, like the tragedy of Summerhall, he, part of him also has to realize, well, yeah, maybe dragon eggs will hatch for me, but the reason the majority of my family was killed the day of my birth is because my great-grandfather was trying to birth dragons. So sometimes it seems like a bit... Well, it's like, well, yeah, that happened, but I'll get it right. Mm -hmm. I know that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. <clears throat> that's why uh, That's why I think Rhaegar is a, is a sneaky, relatable character for all of us who are trying to suss out the mysteries of the story. Because Rhaegar is the character in the story who essentially realized he was in a story and mm -hmm. was trying to figure it out um, and did his best, but just, you know couldn't quite get it uh couldn't quite thread the needle so mm -hmm. moving on to the slightly more far-fetched but not impossible ideas let's talk about magic horns gray waste tim mm -hmm. all right so when it comes to the horn of winter uh we have to look at it from two ends because they think that it's broken when john blows into it it makes no sound and but there's also but after he blows into it it's not long after that the others show up and attack the fists of the first men. So it, we got we look at this from two angles. Is the horn broken, or is it working and doing exactly as it intended, which would mean, is it a dog whistle for the others? But if we go with the route that the horn is broken, well, then where are the missing pieces to it? So hold on. Before we do the broken horn thing, let's go back to the silent horn thing. Mm -hmm. um, I really like this idea for a few reasons. One, dragon binder is ungodly loud. Mm -hmm. So it would make sense if the other horn is silent. Silent. Um, the idea of the dog whistle makes sense because, again, I just said the Starks are like the wolf trained to be the guard dog. That would make the others the wolves. Um, they would be, and they are very much like wolves. They hunt in packs and they, you know, they're effectively similar. So I definitely think the idea of a silent horn makes sense. They did show up to the fist right after that thing was blown. It doesn't have to be causation equals correlation but it certainly could be mm -hmm. um it's the horn of winter the dragon binder calls dragons so the horn of winter calls the others like it kind of makes sense right um yep. and then finally the weirwoods themselves express a silent shout or scream um they look to be screaming but make no sound so this uh, ghost also is a wolf that is silent so there's this whole thing about a silent shout or scream that you can't hear mm -hmm. stuff like that. And so the, the idea that there's a silent horn makes a lot of sense. Um, but let's talk about the broken horn or the idea of a matching horn, because that's obviously we know where the horn of winter is and it's not in the crypts or at least the one that, that John found on the fist. Um, but go yeah, ahead. That's with Sam. Uh, but the idea is that if the horn is broken and if there is a missing piece, well, the piece that they have that is currently Sam is found north of the wall. And the idea that I was thinking of is that if there is a missing piece, it's probably south of the wall. It's probably in Winterfell and it's probably in the crypts. And the way I envision this is 
when we hear about the Horn of Winter and its original use, uh, it's during night, the downfall of Night's King when we have an alliance made by uh, the Kings of Winter and Winterfell and Joramin, the King Beyond the Wall. Uh, and this, the King of Winter at the time was Brandon the Breaker. And we're never told, what did Brandon the Breaker break? Now, we've already talked about the Pact of Ice and Fire, how it was never fulfilled because Jace died before he could produce a daughter. And the pact between the First Men and the Children of the Forest, well, that was broken once the Andals came in. So the idea of broken pacts, it's, it's not something new. It's something the Starks are have, have engaged in, which is why when I always say, like, the North doesn't remember, the North forgets. The North forgets a lot of things, and I think this might be one of those things that the North forgets. If there was a pact made between the Free Folk and, and the Starks, the idea is that like maybe it was a pact of, okay, if this ever happens again, if another Night's Kings rises we will align together and put an end to this. And Brandon the Breaker broke the horn and it was a, okay, half of this stays with you, half of this stays with us. And if this happens again, we'll reunite it and we'll do what we did again until the next time. Because it seems like whatever happened with Knight's King did not truly end. It was just sealed, which is why we have this idea of like the stole. That because obviously the the others were not defeated; they just went away. They went into hibernation. But then we have this stolen other baby who probably then became, in turn, became a king of winter in their own right. Which is then how, and then through their lineage, is then how we get these Starks with the blood of the other. And it's not far fetched too, because the Starks also have through other marriage marriage pacts made in the past. They married into the Marsh Kings. They married the daughters of the Ward King. Uh, they married uh, daughters of the Barrow King. So the Starks have been, over time, kind of picking up these little magical lineages that that then still have uh, effects on them today, even if they are more minuscule as time has gone on. Yeah, I like that a lot. Um, the Again, with uh, George has chosen certain themes, and then he repeats them time and time again. So just what you're saying with the packs, it makes it makes a ton of sense. Um, and as far as the broken horn, we've obviously seen a ton of broken sword symbolism. Horns and swords are very much parallel symbols. Um, before a horn is a tooting horn, it's a stabbing horn, of course, because it's on the head of an animal, um, and they're using it to, uh, you know poke each other and and uh signify their their manliness but it's it's a pokey weapon just like a sword and then it turns into a sounding weapon um but of course we also have swords named after sounds and screams like widow's whale um and then of course dragon binder's sound is like a sword so there's there's a running sword horn symbol um when lightbringer was forged nissa nissa's scream it was the sound that broke the moon but actually it was a comet that would have broken the moon. So is it, is it a giant celestial sword or is it a sound that we're given both ideas? And then again, dragon binder is a sound. It sounds like a woman's scream, but also like a sword thrust that splits the air. It's a horn, but it's banded in Valerian steel and it lights up on fire. So we've mm -hmm. got Valerian steel lighting on fire. That's an obvious light bringer symbolism happening on the horn. All that is to say there's a lot of broken sword stuff going on. The last hero sword breaks. Ned's sword is reforged into two different swords. Um, George is riffing on even more broken sword stuff from Lord of the Rings um, and twin sword stuff from Elric, as I've discussed in the Nightbringer series. So the idea that there could be two halves of a horn that need to be reunited would parallel the idea that broken swords can be reforged, which is a line... Uh, John uh, gives. Um, so the other thing is that if it's not um, the other half of the horn, Tim, what if it's a matching horn? Uh, because mm -hmm. we've seen Dragonbinder has a close match in the form of the, the horn that Melisandre burnt that was oh, yeah. called the Horn of Winter, but yep. almost exactly matched Dragonbinder. So yes. animals usually have two horns unless they're a one-horned uh, horny goat. Um, <laughs> otherwise they got two horns. Uh, so, you know, I've joked that dragon binder and the one that Mel, uh, burnt 
which are way too big to be aurochs horns um were the the horns the the two horns of azor high's dragon right yeah because um, it's this horn well, when they describe this horn it's eight feet long it's it's black it's banded in gold it has these root it has runes on it so it sounds almost exactly like dragon binder and when mel throws it on the flames it like shimmers in this green and gold light so yeah there's this idea of they might have just burned a second dragon finder and that is just the biggest oopsies daisies you could pull so yeah so it could be <laughs> that there is a twin horn, you know, cause again, animals have two horns. So, <laughs> you know, whatever animal that was, they used to make the Sam's little horn of winter, uh, potentially the other horn is down there in the crypt. So um, also the idea of a song of ice and fire, well, a song usually is created when two singers or instruments play together. So people have joked about blowing dragon binder and the horn of winter at the same time. Um, and Euron is in position to have both of them eventually. Um, but yeah, maybe maybe that you need the two the two silent horns to like bring down the wall, create the uh, the cross waves interference that will shatter the ice or something, right? Yeah, that would make sense too, because the other things we're told about the horn of winter is like that it will bring down the wall uh, and that it will wake giants from the earth. But it said that. King, jo King Beyond the Wall Jorman blew into the horn, but the wall's still standing. So if the Horn of Winter is supposed to bring down the wall, well, then it didn't work when he did it. So what else does it do? And then there is Waking Giants from the Earth. Well, Giants from the Earth, that could be a reference to literal giants, or it could be a reference to the others themselves. But then that goes back to this idea of the horn work. The horn's not broken. It's working exactly as intended. It's a dog whistle for others. Right. So there's so there's a few good possibilities there um, with with the idea of a horn in the crypts. Um, I would rate the likelihood a little bit lower than some of the other things that we've talked about. Um, but it could be there. And another reason why it might be down there is that Mance Raider was opening up the graves of giants and things in the Frost Fangs to find the Horn of Jorman. So that could very well be the thing that he's looking for in the crypts right now, because we know from Theon's chapters, Mance is trying to find his way into the crypts. So I, for one, do not think that Mance's story is done. I'm only 50% on Ramsey's letters where he says that he's got Mance in a cage. Um, I think that he definitely discovered that Mance Raider was there, obviously, um, unless the letter isn't from Ramsey at all, which is very possible. Point is, I'm only halfway convinced that Mance is in the cage. And even if he's in the cage, he's obviously going to get out. He's just way too tricksy to die in a cage. And he's way too cool of a character. So mm -hmm. he's looking for something in the crypts. The Horn of Jorman is actually the most likely thing that he would be looking for. That doesn't mean it's down there. But again, he was looking in graves for the horn. And mm -hmm. looking in the graves of giants in the Frost Fangs is not that different from looking in the graves of the oldest kings of winter down in the Stark Crypts. This, symbolically and thematically, these are similar ideas. And if you're Mance and you didn't find it yet, it might be one of the other places on your list to look. Mm -hmm. He might have been looking for it when he came to Winterfell last time and and you know didn't know how to get down there. Also, it was in the notes I pointed out, another place where Mance was looking, where he's opening up graves looking for it, is also along the Meltwater. And the milk water is interesting symbolically because when Sam kills the other, it melts into a pool of water and its bones are milk glass. And so when and then once uh, John opens the wall and lets the wildlings pass through, D Tormund uses the phrase where he says, it's like uh, the milk. It's like a reed drinking up the milk water. So we have this symbolic language. It's, it's plant talk of the uh the milk uh the milk water flowing through a reed and then the others are pale like milk and they have these milk glass bones and they melt into water it's it's symbolic talk of the others come from the trees mm. yeah that was a good little catch um and uh yeah it just you could see if 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 mance's path like i said if he's it, he's it would make sense if he's still looking for the horn of joraman and if he ends up finding it, then that would that would tie him to all that other symbolism, which he has. Uh, yeah. Okay. Right, Sorry, my cockatoo is distracting me just a little bit. 
Uh, for um, those, we got a super chat. Yes. Uh, let's see here. From the real Rick, how might the geothermal activity beneath Winterfell relate to the crypts? Well, like we said, it's the reason why Vermax went down there to lay eggs. Um, it's uh, it's a very practical. It's a, like a very practical reason for Winterfell to become the stronghold of the North against the others during the first long night. Because it's like, where would you, where would you want to build a castle in the frozen wasteland? Like around a hot springs. It's just really obvious. Um, it's a source of water and heat. So no matter how cold the long night gets and how brutal the others, you know, winter is that they can bring, you've at least got water and heat inside your castle. So I think it's very significant in understanding the importance of Winterfell just on a practical level. Mm -hmm. um, and then it also ties to the idea that eggs are down there uh, or that a dragon likes to go down there. Um, and it also ties into the just the general symbolism that I was talking about with the Starks of that they have all the secret fire symbolism hiding out, you know, as an outpost against the ice. Okay, girl, come here. Yeah. And if I could take a crack at that one, um, cause I did have two in the notes, uh, one's based on like a scientific explanation and another's more of a symbolic explanation. Um, there is the idea that Winterfell might be sitting on, if, if we're looking at it like real world plate tectonics, that the North may be sitting on diverging tectonic plates. And that can explain hot springs at Winterfell. And it also would explain flooding at the neck and Moat Kaelin because it's obvious that Moat Kaelin had, there's no way it was built into the swamp. The flood, Moat Kaelin had to have been flooded after it was built. Well, and then we already have this story of the hammer of the waters, but, and then we see like how the, how it, the North is situated, how the neck, like it is, it, bo it bottlenecks and then it widens back out. So if this is actually diverging tectonic plates coming in, that would explain some of this geothermal activity that's happening up in the North. Um, um Yes, I like that theory a lot. Um, and also, of course, hard home shows strong signs of being geothermal. So there's it's, it's running all through the north. And also the germal, geothermal activity is, gives us a way to have dragon glass. So if George wants there to be dragon glass deposits up there, there needs to have been volcanoes up there at some point at least. So um, real quick, someone in the chat is building an oboe out of our horn of winter. And says that uh, you know, adding a reed to a horn, maybe that'll help tune it or fix it, you know, that it'll uh, make some sound. That's some classic George wordplay. I like that. I like that. So <laughs> we just need Mira Reed to blow the horn of winter. Oh uh, <laughs> I dig it. I love oboes too, so I had to uh, you know. Yeah. Anyways. Um, and then the other thing I want to say was for may spore on a symbolic sense. We know that uh, George had a Catholic upbringing and that sometimes influenced his story. And I had mentioned at the beginning of the stream, how every culture has a flooding myth. Uh, one thing with the hot springs is I think George might be playing on the, the fountains of the great deep, which is a flood myth in Genesis uh, because the Hebrew word for fountain, it also translates as spring. And when we translate it from Hebrew to Greek, to Greek and then back to English, then it becomes abyssos. And that makes me think of the cave that uh, Blood Raven is in because that has an abyss. And that is where the weirwood thrones that the children of the forest have made for Blood Raven and then make for Bran. They sit on the abyss in the cave. Well, and down on that abyss, there is a river that runs to a sunless sea. So George is absolutely doing that. And his favorite science fiction from the 60s and 70s that's a big trope, the underground earth, underground seas, all that type of stuff. Lovecraft deals with it. Mm -hmm. um, so I totally think that's a thing. Yeah. And I also think that uh, um, uh, so the thought just flew out of my brain. Jog my memory. Uh, what were you just saying? Start back into it. Oh, that. Uh, oh, the springs, the springs. Yeah, Sorry, I got playing it. On the so power. that's also in Norse mythology. Um, all of the wells under Yggdrasil are actually springs, not really like stone wells. They're, they're well springs. Um, and, and, uh, I believe it is those, I think there are floods that come from those springs, but don't quote me on that. Um, but yes, I, I generally agree with what you're saying here as far as, uh, George playing with this idea. It is a very cool idea. It's very primal. 
Um, and it ties into the sort of the way that George uses the symbolism of the sea to represent the unconscious, the astral realm and stuff like that. So I dig it. And of course, there's also a sneaky, the, you know, there's several flood myths, the hammer of the waters mm -hmm. during God's grief. And also on the iron islands, it's said that the, um, the uh, storm God drowned all of the works of the gray King, including his throne and his, his, uh, his, uh, I think he had a, starfish table or some shit like that i don't know in any case it was all drowned uh by the storm god so they're they're talking about a flood there and obviously there's been massive land collapse around the iron islands so it does seem there were cataclysmic floods of course i'm just those would just be moon meteor splashes yeah uh, in my opinion and, uh, but they no doubt happen. So, and George is writing this from a perspective of real human history is that this could all be the same event, but we're just looking at it through different cultural interpretations of it. Right. And, and just to pluck the low hanging fruit here, one myth talks about a hammer of the waters, some great hammer, something huge hammered and broke the land and caused a flood. I don't know what that could be. Okay. Then over on the iron islands, we're told the sea dragon drowned whole islands in its wrath so if a comet or meteor is a dragon then a sea dragon that drowns islands again moon meteor splash is, is all we're talking about here so mm -hmm. but uh this is again low-hanging fruit if you watch this channel you know all about that tech life says is it possible that brand seeing the night king creation with blood raven in the tv show obviously is equivalent to the white-haired woman slashing a bearded man throat uh in his visions Kind of, sort of. Um, this is a fun thing to speculate on what that last vision was. Uh, a white-haired woman forces a captive down onto his knees with a sickle-shaped blade, cuts his throat. Bran can taste the blood. There's also another dude there, a dark-haired man with the old woman. So <clears throat> some sort of human sacrifice to the weirwoods, at the very least. Could this be cold hands? Could this be the creation of the night king some some very specific specific act or is it just to show us the starks did blood sacrifice um i'm kind of 50 50 on that whether that's a specific person or just a general concept what do you think tim i also think i'm 50 50 again because the way george writes when he never gives us concrete evidence and he always he always writes in a way where it could go one way or go the other i mean I guess if I had to pick one, I would say this was a simple sacrifice to the weirwood trees. It might not have even been like it might not have been a Stark. It could have just been like a captive, uh, a captive of war that they sacrificed to the weirwoods just as a means of honoring them. Just like how sacrifices were made for a bountiful harvest or to honor the gods or for whatever reason, for whatever it is that people want it from their gods, they made these sacrifices for. It could just be as simple as that. So, um, yeah. It, and, it, and of course, cold hands does have probably a throat wound. So that is a, a tempting link. He has a rattling voice and covers his, his mouth with, the, with a scarf. So I, I do kind of like that idea. Um, and it could it could be that this is the creation of a Night's Watch green zombie as well. I've, I've talked about that, that they may have begun with a ritual sacrifice to the weirwood in order to resurrect the person. But I, if I had to vote, I would say that this is just a clue to show us human sacrifice. It may also be uh, something to make us focus on Lady Stoneheart because of her neck being slashed as well and having the gravelly voice because of it. Yes, and of course, this is all weirwood stigmata also. Um, and I wanted to go back to the Leanna statue. Um, one of the things that could be down here that we're going to get to is weirwood thrones. And um, I've talked about this before, obviously. But Leanna's statue in Ned's dream is weeping blood. And that makes her a pretty good weirwood symbol. The weirwood trees turn to stone when they petrify. So they already are stone trees, they have faces that weep blood. So here's Leanna, who's dead. And of course, she may very well have had the same skin changer or green sea or, you know, recessive traits that all the other Starklings have. She would have. Um, so it's sort of a parallel to the idea of dead green seers in the weirwood net. We see dead Leanna kind of looking like a weirwood tree um, in, in statue form when she's weeping blood like that. Uh, so then... 
like I said, this could be an allusion to the idea that there are weird thrones down there. Um, so some of the events of Knights, King and Queen and the creation of the others, which we mostly associate with the Night Fort, it is possible that some of those events could be tied to Winterfell as well. I just want to throw that out there as an aside. We'll get to the Weirwood Thrones in a second. Um, let's do Gorn's Way first, because this actually piggybacks onto that Sunless Sea idea that we were just talking about. The cave in Blood Raven's Cave, the idea that there's a river down there, Gorn's Way. Um, go ahead and take it away with this. All right, so Gorn's Way. This is a story of uh, two brothers, kings. They were shared kings beyond the wall, Gorn and Gendel, who mediated a dispute between the children of the forest and the giants over ownership of a cavern. And when they discovered that this cavern connects to a chain that ran beneath the wall, they used trickery to claim it for themselves. And when you think using trickery, you're like, one, that kind of makes me think of Land the Clever in a way. But with Gorn, what they did was it supposedly took place 3,000 years ago. Gorn leads this wildling army through the caverns beneath the wall. Uh, he's met by Winterfell forces. He kills the King of Winter, but he is in then turn killed by that king's son. His brother Gendel uh, retreats back beneath the wall, but he doesn't know the way as well as Gorn and gets lost. And according to the story that Egrit tells John. Uh, Gendel's children, the descendants of them, are still living down there and that they attack and feast on the flesh of whoever tries to find the cavern entrance or end or exit. And so this implies that <clears throat> there are just really the caves are very extensive. It's a it's a well-known fantasy trope, of course. Um, I always mention the silver chair. Are you familiar with uh, Chronicles of Narnia, Tim? Uh, no, I haven't read it. <clears throat> So on the silver chair, they they go there. They, they complete a tremendous overland journey. They go underground a ways. They get what they need to, and then they keep following the caverns and come above ground, the sort of back where they started. Oh, okay. um, <clears throat> and of course, it's again, it's like a, it's kind of a cool trope, uh, and, and a lot of it is from, again, the idea of a hollow earth or places under the earth you can go to. Very popular in the '60s and '70s. So. It's absolutely the kind of thing that George would play with. Um, Quinn, from Quinn's ideas during our Winds of Winter predictions, and, and I don't think he's the first person to say this, but he was talking about the idea that Mira Reed is going to, you know, they're going to leave Blood Raven's cave in a boat um, that Mira could potentially make uh, with, you know, bark and weirwood roots or whatever else that they can get down there. Uh, she knows how to make reed boats. That's her whole mm -hmm. thing. And uh, it makes a lot more sense than Mira dragging the sled, you know, like in the TV show, dragging Bran through the woods while wh whites run after them. I mean, you can only drag a person on a sled so far if you're not like a huge beast like Hodor, you know, beast of a man, like a, a slight person. Like I couldn't drag someone very far on a sled through the woods mm -hmm. while the while the others were chasing me. So this doesn't really make sense. Um, it was a long journey that they undertook to get to Blood Raven's cave. So really, I mean, I guess cold hands could be waiting outside to guide them back or whatever. But without makes, the elk, what, without I think the it, elk though, <laughs> right? Yeah, the elk's dead. The elk's dead. <laughs> exactly. Um, and Blood Raven or uh, Cold Hands killed the last uh, sow in the woods to mm -hmm. uh to feed everyone long um, pig <laughs> yeah long pig so yeah really it's almost more likely than not that that brand is going to make it some distance back to the realm of the living through the caves mm -hmm. um and the river makes the most sense why else put it there and again why else put uh a canoe building crano lady uh yep. right there so exactly love I'm this the idea page they could get back to the wall or they could get further. Um, yep. We during the the bat didn't the uh, the wildlings come up at Long Lake? Yes. Okay. So let me pull up my map so people can see where Long Lake is. All right. Share screen. From Long Pig to Long Lake. Let's see here. So we're going to zoom in on the north. Choo, choo. 
So Long Lake is pretty far down. I'll go a little closer. It's more than halfway to Winterfell from the wall. Um, now the lake is long, <laughs> hence the name. So we don't know if they, they probably came up maybe near the north end of it. But that's literally that's almost halfway to Winterfell at the north end of the lake. Um, and it's if you were to travel the same distance from the wall northward, you'd get pretty close to Blood Raven's cave potentially. We don't know exactly where it is, but you'd get well past Hard Home, well into the into the haunted forest. So, if there's caves from the wall all the way to Long Lake, it is no stretch to imagine that they reach all the way to Winterfell and to Blood Raven's cave, and perhaps even through the entire friggin' continent. Oh, uh, I. I am a proponent that these underground cave systems connected through rivers at, at joints. I think they go all the way from door to the frost fangs. And I, what's going into the dock, I, I brought up like all of these different cave systems because we have them. Um, and you brought up Quinn, which makes me want to segue this into how Dorn is kind is kind of like uh, all the Dune symbolism that's in Dorn because. Of how uh, when we Do it think, up. yeah, when we think back to like the uh, Aegon's conquest and how he couldn't take Dorne, the people of Dorne just kind of they melted into the sand, they just disappeared, which then leads to the idea that there's probably some underground cities, and then Dorne is a desert, yet it had they have they make wine and they produce all <laughs> these citrus fruits, so it seems like they have like these underground irrigation systems, like uh canets if i'm pronouncing that right and that, and that makes me think well if they're secret cities then they're probably and i'm probably announcing this wrong too because i'm always bad i've read dune but i'm always bad the with siege. the dune the so siege, in the new movie yes. they're saying siege and i was going to make a joke how probably a lot of people in the audience maybe just learned that word mm -hmm. in the last two weeks seeing dune but yeah the siege is their underground hold fest if you will um yep yeah and i think dorn has sieges and that's where the people were disappearing to while it, when Aegon and his sisters were trying to conquer. Cause well, well I'll do you. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. They had, they just had to disappear. They had to go somewhere. And we know in Dorne, there is uh, in Sunspear, there is the secret city. And then we also know that there are these uh, where the, uh, where the red vultures hid in the red, uh, the vulture King, I'm sorry, in the red mountains hid in these cave cavern systems that were up in the mountains. So we know that Dorne, are, and with these irrigation systems, the idea is, well, did, are they man-made or are they kind of natural or is it a mixture of both? And if the caverns were already there and they're just kind of building upon it as a way of irrigating this desert landscape, and then these caverns can lead up forward through past the Red Mountains up into the Stormlands and further. So um, I will do you one better here. Uh, there is a lot of sneaky Dune references in A Song of Ice and Fire, actually. Mm -hmm. um, some people, for example, that like to challenge my Great Empire of the Dawn, ironclad Great Empire of the Dawn theory, which basically is built on the few stone fortress at Old Town, saying only dragons and dragon lords that can control dragons can make few stone fortresses. This thing is under the high tower, therefore... Dragon Lords were in Westeros before the High Tower was built, which probably means before the Long Night. Some people have suggested that maybe it was fireworms, people with fireworms before dragons were made that maybe built the Five Forts or other few stone. And I've pointed out that if if people if if uh, if Dragon Lords rode fireworms, that it would it'd be too close to Dune, <laughs> because the Dune worms actually do have furnace fires inside of them. So they are basically fireworms. Um, but that's not my main point. My main point is that with the sieges and the Dornish, the Dornish uh, you know, melting away into the caves, this is what the first men would have done to survive the long night. And this is why all the oldest castles in, in uh, Westeros are built around weirwood trees as Winterfell is. Because we know that the caves are always under the weirwood trees. Shout out to Wiz the Smith and the Hollow Hills essay. Carl Karsnark, if you could post that link, I would appreciate that. Um, basically, Wisda Smith goes through every Weirwood location and shows that there are caves under there. Um, mm -hmm. The Weirwood roots are so big, and the Weirwoods being mostly underground organisms, it could be that the Weirwood roots are what are digging these caves. 
Um, yep. But they could just naturally exist. Point being, uh, I do believe that places like Winterfell would have been little bastions against the original Long Night and that the survivors uh, would have been mostly living in caves underground and under the guidance and protection of the children of the forest who would have been able to show them how to eat the fish and the mushrooms in the caves and how to make blood stew or like basically how to eat white meat, um, not pork white meat, but W-I-G-H-T white meat. <laughs> um, and so, and that's what we're told. We're told that the last hero and the first men of the Night's Watch were aided by the children of the forest. Um, and I believe that the pact between the first men and the children was a result, what happened at the time of the long night, because this is really the only explanation that we're given that could uh, explain why the first men left behind all their old religions and then started mm -hmm. worshiping the weirwoods of the children of the forest, even though they had just been cutting them down and warring against the children. Well, the yeah. children seem to have helped the first men survive the long night. So it makes sense that the first men at the point that they were rallying to battle the others, they would have been living in caves and learning from the children. Um, and they would have been huddled around these weirwood trees. And that is why these fortresses like Storm's End and uh, Winterfell and other places were built around weirwood trees. Yep. And because when we think of these cave systems too, like so, uh, we start in Dorne and we talk like the sieges, uh, go up to the Stormlands, Arian and company in the, uh, Arian sample chapter for Winds of Winter, uh, she ends up in a cave system in the Rainwood. And the Rainwood, because we don't hear about weirwoods growing in Dorne, but they are in the Rainwood. And so far, that's the furthest south we know of where weirwoods still grow in the forest. And beneath the weirwoods, here's here's another cavern system. Well, there's one at um on the Isle of Ravens at Old Town, actually. Oh, okay. Um, it's a it's a pretty significant one. It's the one where the white ravens roost. And it's got some purple moss across its face, which I think it could be interesting symbolism. But it's neither here nor there. Um, well, no, yeah, that actually are, the the Dorn is interesting because um, that's the well, you could, that's we see them growing wild there, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas the the one in uh, in uh, High Garden may still have theirs in their God's Wood, for all we know. And the one at the Isle of Ravens is like one specific weirwood tree that grows there, as opposed to them growing wild in a forest. So. Yeah, the rainwood is highly significant, and of course, we see the caves there are implied as equally depthless and endless. So, and then in the there, I had examples for the other. I didn't have one for the reach, so I'm glad you pointed that one out. But I do have uh, Casterly Rock. There's the Stone Garden uh, cave within the rock. There's a twisted weirwood tree. Its tangle roots fill the cave, choking out all other life. Uh, the Riverlands, of course, we have the Hollow Hill, where the Brotherhood Without Banners is hiding out. Uh, that hill has numerous tunnels, crannies, and crevices. Arya is not able to tell how far the cave tunnels extend. And Beric, uh, Beric Knights Gendry, there as Sir Gendry, Knight of the Hollow Hill. Uh, and the cave that Lady Stoneheart is residing in matches the description of Hollow Hill, which has these weirwood roots that create a form of stairway that then lead to this tangle of roots that barracks sitting on which is like a makeshift weirwood throne 100 percent, yeah uh let's see um okay so i'm checking out a super chat from tech life if knights queen and king created the others at the night fort which does seem to be the likely story um where does the heart of winter come into play was it where azel rahai stabbed his guma what i don't know the word guma um but obviously azor high stab nissa no i think the azor high nissa nissa thing my number one guess is the isle of faces uh for that because i think that the myth of all the blood sacrifice on the isle of faces that called down the hammer of the waters is actually part of the truth it was azor high sacrificing nissa nissa and perhaps green men on the isle of faces that called down the moon meteors which was the hammer of the waters um, and then the myth eventually made its way back to a shy because that's where Azor High is from. So that is why I think it happened in Westeros. Heart of Winter, however, the Heart of Winter should represent the home of the others or like the place where they were forced out into. Mm -hmm. um, I've often spoken of a bifurcated weirwood net um, and have also spoken of the others being driven out of the weirwood net. Um, the basic idea 
is that the Azor Rahai invades the Weirwood Tree and pushes out the Green Seer spirits, which become the others. The more complex idea is that the Weirwood Net, meaning the astral realm that the Weirwood Net um, lives, the the Green Seer hive mind lives in, the 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 place that Blood Raven and Bran can send their spirits into to see all the, the different things that have ever happened. That astral plane seems to have been bifurcated, just like Westeros was bifurcated with the wall, with the others being exiled to one half. And that is why they have all the frozen pond symbolism that matches the green sea symbolism of the green seers. So think about if the weirwood net is like a sea, well, half of it, it was cut in half. Half of it is frozen. That's where the others live. So I think that we should see a weirwood hub that equals the God's eye in the heart of winter, but it's going to be frozen and corrupted. And it's going to sort of symbolize represent what the others have left of the weirwoods or the, the corrupted state of the weirwoods. So the heart of winter, <clears throat> I think that it's going to end up being a parallel to Bill, um, to Frodo and Sam where there's a, there's a battle going on at the gates of Mordor around the wall or Winterfell, but then a couple of people have to go behind the lines and do a magical errand. And I talked about that on the live stream, Journey to the Heart of Winter. It would obviously be John and Danny and maybe a little Last Heroes dozen going north, you know, to, to do some magic shit. So I don't want to go into all that, things that they could do, but that is where the Heart of Winter comes into play, Tech Life. And thank you for the super chat. Uh, anything you want to add to that, Tim? Uh, just talking like when we think of the Isle of Faces as like the main hub of the Weirwood Net, one thing we did have in our notes, I'm kind of jumping ahead, is this idea of these weir I call them Weirwood.net data banks. And it seems like if we're going to, if we use these computer analogies, the Isle of Faces is like the main CPU, but then you also, also have like all of these external hard drives where there's like different amount, different information where a green seer could go download it and get information on that. And it seems like the crypts that Winterfell is one of these hubs. And I can also see like Storm's End being one of these hubs, uh, the High Tower being one of these hubs. Something that they all share in common is that they all have Brand the Builder being in some way connected with them. So the wall would also be a hub. Uh, I also think of like. I made the jo uh, made a joke in our notes too, like Raven Tree Hall, the Raven that was the weirwood that was poisoned by the Brackens. That, that's like a corrupted data bank. That's like one that got hacked. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. Um, that the different trees could have different information. I tend to see it all as like a continuum that's supported by all the trees collectively. Uh, but maybe that we... they maybe that they don't have different information, but that if they're all sort of the same information, but maybe it's just a, a matter of distance. Well, like not everyone's going to be able to get to the Isle of Faces, but maybe I'm close enough to go to Storm's End and download from that computer. Oh, okay. I like got that, you. Like yeah, that, that kind of makes idea. sense. So where's the nearest ATM uh, <laughs> charging station for my EV or whatever? Mm -hmm. um, well, okay. So I don't mind jumping around because we're kind of getting near the end here. And we've kind of said what there is to say about Gorn's way. Um, the major purpose of that would be as a way for Bran to get back to Winterfell. Uh, and if it would make sense that this is an ancient secret that the Starks know about, like down in the, like there's a collapsed wall down there. Right. So maybe behind the collapsed wall or on the lower levels will be entrances to a cave. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, we could probably isolate that as a simple idea and separate it from the idea that, you can get all the way from Blood Raven's Cave to Winterfell. Even if that's not the case, um, it seems certain that the crypts must connect to caves down there somewhere, right? I mean, because the, the first keep is right next to the Godswood. So when you go down in the crypts and walk out into one of those wings, you should be basically under the Godswood at that point. So, yeah, in my mind, there's, there's got to be a connection to caves just a connection of a matter of like, what's the point? Can you get outside the castle into the, into the wolf's wood or can you, you know, get on the river and, and, and go all the way to the wall or somewhere. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about the cave in two, one thing that 
I've wondered too is is the cave in a natural cave in from like the geothermal activity or was it something that was doctored by the Starks as a means of sealing something away? And if it was doctored, like if they purposely caused a cave in, a good reason for that would be sealing up these entrance, sealing up these uh, pathways so that the wildlings couldn't do it again. That does make sense. Um, that does make sense. And obviously the more conspiratorial idea is that, that, that this, this was buried on purpose. And it could tie into the idea that Knight's King's name was erased. Um, there could be a bit of a cover-up going on here. Yeah, certainly. Uh, so let's see. So that's mostly it for the 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 Gorn's way. So let's talk about some of the Weirwood ideas uh, and some of the Knight's King and Queen stuff is a little further afield, but I think that it dovetails with the Weirwood Throne idea. So. The Weirwood Throne idea is pretty simple. Um, again, it builds right up. You can we've basically walked right up to saying it. Like we're saying that there's always caves under the God's Woods, right? And we're saying that the crypts of Winterfell, part of it at least, has to be under Winterfell's God's Wood. So the idea of finding a Weirwood Throne down there is pr would pretty much be par for the course. Um, not shocking in any in any way at all. Um it the seems more, more shocking, shocking thing could what's that? I'm sorry, I, I said it seems it seems more shock it would be more shocking to me if the Starks didn't have a weirwood throne of their own, considering that the Aarons have one in the Vale where weirwood trees can't even grow. Right. Um, and so the thing that could be shocking is if there's like something sitting in the throne still, right? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> you know, maybe just skeletons. But one of the ideas that I discussed on my original Halloween Crips live stream is that. Some of the oldest, uh, the Starks have sepulchers. So behind those statues are little rooms with like stone tombs in them. So there are little rooms back there. So plenty of room for a harp and some dragon's eggs or whatever. But the point is that uh, on the lowest levels of the crypts, there could be weirwood thrones inside every one of those sepulchers. Just as in Blood Raven's Cave, we see rows of enthroned singers who are basically far gone. They're completely absorbed into the weirwood net, but their bodies are still partially alive and vaguely aware of things happening around them. Um, we don't know how old those singers are. The fact that there are more than one means they're probably centuries old, Tim. Mm -hmm. And so could there be dead or half-living kings of winter on their weirwood thrones or even just skeletons um on weirwood thrones i it could be just one throne down there but there could be multiple thrones and that because i really think that some of the original kings of winter would have been green seer kings not just skin changer kings with wolves but actual green seer kings so there needs to be at least one throne down there for that to be true but it could be that as the kings of winter retire they're given new thrones because they make a throne for bran Mm -hmm. right it's a yeah. combination of living roots and dead branches that they weave together to make the throne so they very easily could make new thrones for each king of winter as they get too old to serve upstairs they retire downstairs there could be something basically parallel mm -hmm. to blood raven's cave down there but with stark kings of winter instead of old singers that that's what i'm trying to say yeah i can see that too don't yeah. over picking up what i'm laying down here <laughs> Come here, girl. Uh, I don't know if you guys noticed, but um, Nimble Dick's machete now hangs proudly on the wall of Dave. So anytime one of them squishers shows up, we need to chop them blubbery lips or webbed hands and feet off. We'll be ready to do that. So, <clears throat> uh, excuse me. Sorry, I had a frog in my throat. Did my voice sound different to you for a second there? I'd... <clears throat> me, me, me. Sorry. Oh, there we go. That's better now. Uh, what if there is so this is from M box? What if there is an evil green seer in the heart of winter who is running the others? Uh, absolutely. Um, I have said that I think that Azor High became Night's King in some sense. Again, father, son, we don't know how many Azor Highs there were, but Night's King is, is a dragon person. I'm fairly certain one of the Azor High people became Night's King and, and fathered the others. 
Um, so whatever people might perceive as the great other, quote unquote, could simply be dead Azor High spirit inside the other's half of the weirwood net, this frozen half that I'm talking about. So absolutely, I mean, at the very least, his presence would be inside the weirwood trees that I think are in the in the heart of winter. Um, but you could see something on a throne too, potentially. It would just be a maybe an icy skeleton at that point, um, which would be really pretty. Milk glass skeleton in a weirwood throne. Bring it to me, George. Yeah, because I could see like the others kind of act like they act like a hive mind, but if there's someone at the helm, like you know, the man behind the curtain running the show, it could be like the will of Azor Ahai still corrupting the weirwood net that's driving them forward. Yes, and uh and uh I call this the Inaluki parallel from Memory Sorrow and Thorn. Uh again, shout out to Gray Area and her playlist on Memory Sorrow and Thorn, which I always recommend. Uh, Inaluki is an Azor Ahai Night's King-like figure who's been dead a long time, but is seeking a way to be reincarnated into the world, as evil sorcerers do. Um, so uh, one of the things about stealing John's body could could be that it, it is the spirit of dead Azor Ahai that's going to possess his body, which would make him Azor Ahai reborn in kind of a fucked up weird way, um, which is the kind of thing George likes to do, right? So. Uh, yeah, and I've also talked about Euron potentially getting body snatched by said spirit. So that spirit may be looking for a way to get out. Uh, uh, speaking of body snatching with someone, Alex Van Oud, and thinking, uh, think of Blood Raven grooming Bran for a stronger body. Blood Raven is a literal weirwood throne. I've actually, this is what I'm on board too. I think uh, George might go invasion of the body snatchers that Blood Raven is grooming Bran to be, to be like a new body that. Blood Raven might try to body snatch Bran, and that when Bran does sit the throne at the end, it might be uh, Blood Raven wearing Bran's skin. So that that's Brendan Stark theory. I know uh, some people do like that theory. I know Quinn has dabbled with that. Uh, Tony Teflon is a fan of something like that happening. Um, you know, Blood Raven's one of my favorite characters in the story, and he is a bit Machiavellian, but I would be personally disappointed if he is grooming Bran to steal his body, I really would. Uh, I don't think that's the case. I don't think it's a bad theory. Uh, I just think, I just don't think it's the way George is going to go. And that might be wishful thinking. I don't know. Um, but Bran is such a main character. I don't think he can lose his agency like that. Uh, that's one of my main issues with it. Um, and I just think that Bran, uh, I think that blood Raven is fine with going into the trees and passing on the information to Bran. I just think that's his role. And, it's pretty yeah. straightforward Mr. Miyagi shit, in my opinion. Um, well, that's the, the dark side, Tim, if I could just finish my thought, the dark side to it is that he doesn't really care about Bran himself. He's only concerned with the fate of the world. So in whatever way that uses up Bran, destroys yeah. his innocence, he doesn't give a shit about that. In the same way that Quave or even Marwin the Mage, they want to help Danny fight the others, but they're not like Danny's friends. They just know that Danny needs to use the dragons against the others, and that's what needs to happen. So, similarly, all of our heroes, John, Danny, Bran, their innocence is all being lost. Arya, they're all paying heavy prices to be the heroes. That's how it works here. Um, so, I think that that is the sort of dark edge to the Bran Blood Raven thing is that Blood Raven's not telling Bran straight up what it's going to cost him mm -hmm. because then he might not do what he needs to do, which is. If anyone's read the sort of Shannara series, like that's the old Alanon trope, the druid Alanon. He always is pulling that. I can only tell you so much, you know, mm -hmm. <clears throat> or else you wouldn't do what you need to do, which although, is also a dark thing if you watch dark. <laughs> although while we're on the, the idea of a character losing agency, like we kind of we see that with a Victorian, like when his his chapters move from a third from a, a POV to a third person narrative. And there are some that think that when John comes back, the same thing might be said of him, that John, any future John chapters might not be from John's point of view, but might be written in a third person perspective. Yeah, I've wondered about that because so far no dead person has had a had a POV. Um, so I, I do wonder. I, it's hard for me to believe that we'll never get in John's head again, but I don't know. Maybe that's a daring writing thing that George is going to do. 
and force us to look at John's actions from the outside and not know what exactly is going on inside. Um, we'll just have to see. It's one of the things I'm very interested in with Winds of Winter. Um, we could be that we won't get his POV until we get his body back if the others steal it. It could be uh, very late in the book. I'll and that way we'd through. get some period of time where we don't know what's going on inside John's head, but eventually we'll get back in there. So, um, yeah, so let's let's do give Gray Waste Tim a shout out for how well he's doing. You're doing excellently, Gray Waste Tim. I'll thank you. Yeah. It's you my barely first smell trip. like a noob. You know, there's <laughs> hardly any noob smell up in here. This is great. Uh, I I put in time. I wanted to do this right. <laughs> yeah, you, been, you did great. You prepared yourself. Uh, you come correct. You're doing a great job. So let's definitely all round of applause for Gray Waste Tim. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, very glad I had you on, and it's going great. And so we just got a couple more points to make here. Um, so the most horrifying thing that could be sitting in a weirwood throne would be like Night's Queen herself or something, right? So, mm -hmm. and I feel like this is the big one that we were leading up to. So, so dive in and closing. I've had my take at this a few times. So go ahead and dive in first and I'll react to, uh, to what you got. Okay. So when we think of Night's King and Night's Queen, Night's King is his name has been stricken from the records, which just screams cover up somewhere. Now, You've you've talked about the idea that maybe Knight's Queen was a Stark. I kind of lean more on Knight's King was a Stark. I think we, we can all agree that no matter what, somehow a Stark was involved because there's definitely a cover up in all this. But when I think of the if we approach the idea from Knight's King as a Stark, it makes me think that if Knight's King was a Stark, his name there's two two ways I see this going. Either he was a Stark named Brandon which then makes old Nan's story to his, her uh, bedtime story to Bran more poignant. Or he was a Stark bastard named Jon Snow. And because when Jon introduces up to Ygritte, she says that that is a cursed name. And I have been fixated on that. Why did she say that? Why is Jon Snow a cursed name? Well, if Night's King was a Stark bastard named Jon Snow, that might be it. The other thing I think of is that maybe uh, let me uh, let me interrupt real quick. Um, and also sorry about Cleo's butt feathers um, blocking the camera. Uh, you guys. Uh, so first of all, we're dropping your Twitter link. Thank you, uh, Miss Minty. Uh, that is the Gray Waste at the Gray Waste on Twitter. Uh, and <laughs> yeah, I, I I put up some of the clapping emojis while you were talking, so there there was much applause. Um, Let's see, what was I going to say? Uh, oh, yes. So if you take the name of Ned, Eddard Stark, mm -hmm. let's call him Ed, mm -hmm. and you take Ed and you put it next to John and you say Ed John, Ed John, kind of sounds like a mispronunciation of Aegon. Oh. Ed John, okay. Now, I, we're going way into wordplay tinfoil land, so don't, uh, entertainment purposes only. Uh, mm -hmm. As my friend Sir Hunts likes to say, shout out to Sir Hunts. Um, <laughs> in the prologue, when Waymar sees the others holding his sword, it says it was it was as thin as like a shard of crystal when seen edge on. Edge on. Okay. So mm -hmm. again, edge on, egg on. And then we're looking at the other's sword, which is a sword of ice. So it's just, it's like a very interesting thing to talk about seeing edge on. Then if you go and search edge on those two words throughout the whole series, it strangely looks like George is referring to Aegon and Azor High ideas every time. So we went deep on this tangent one time just for shits and giggles on Twitter and on a live stream. But I just wanted to say that the idea that somebody's name was John could have been an Aegon that became John. Oh, okay. Just saying. Yeah. Anyway, sorry I wasted everyone's three minutes with that. <laughs> oh no, no, it's it's good. It's, it's like how how uh, diff when Nate when it when just like immigration, how you kind of Americanize uh, an old Germanic name or an old, you know something like that. And and of course, uh, John's best buddy on the wall is Ed Tolle. Yeah. So again, you have Ed John hanging out together. Um, so yeah okay so so <laughs> again i'm sorry oh it's okay it's okay 
We all we all have those tan we all have this those bursts of consciousness. It's like, it's irresistible. For some reason, I really love it. Um, mm -hmm. and it's a running joke with me and Ravenous Reader. Uh, but anyways, uh, so okay, so so going back to Knights King. So it said, oh, oh, I'm sorry. There is there's an there's like an Adirion Stark or something like that. Uh, oh, yeah. which kind of adds to it. And of course, there's the Elric Starks and Edric Starks. So, and Edgeon, it's Just, like, it's almost in the same family of names there. So many, the, the Ed, Ed, and Eddies of Starks. Yeah. <laughs> in there. So, okay. So, so what so, do you think is actually down there that could relate to Knights, King, and Queen? Let's start with that. What do you, what do you think we could see down there? Uh, I am of the opinion that it might literally be their bodies entombed in there because they were uh, because at least one of them was a Stark. And if we think of like, maybe they're not real, if maybe they never truly died, maybe the best that they could deal was seal them up just in the way that the others were never truly defeated. They just kind okay. of retreated and went into hibernation for a while. And that's why I was saying so, uh, before, like, I know we were talking, I was talking more in a literal sense of how the iron could be, the iron swords might be a way of tempering the blood of the other. Well, if you have a full on other, it's going to be really hard to temper that one. Okay. Um, and the idea of Ned bringing Leanna's bones back from the Tower of Joy, which is a long night war for the dawn type of mock up battle, would be parallel to what we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. Somehow, Knight's Queen skeleton or corpse or whatever enchanted sleeping body is brought back to the crypts or maybe that's where the others were defeated um and is is enchanted there or held captive there uh that again that would parallel liana being down there uh yeah. i would lean far more towards something knight's queen associated being down there than knight's king myself and i also as i was saying on the spaceberg stream I'm increasingly coming to believe, as you were discussing, that it's Knight's Queen that was the Stark. Uh, because all the Knight's Queen parallel characters are either Starks or symbolic Starks, like Alice Carr Stark or Jane Poole posing as Arya Stark. Um, or Val, who almost marries John and becomes Lady Stark, uh, according to Stannis' plan. So I do think Knight's Queen was a Stark, as Lyanna was, and that Knight's King was the dragon as Rhaegar was, and as Stannis is symbolically by being Azor High, and as Jon is, etc. Mm -hmm. So that's why I say Knight's Queen would make more sense, plus the Lyanna parallel. Like, Rhaegar's not down there. You know, Lyanna's bones are down there. So it would make sense if there's some Knight's Queen something. Um, come here. Would it be... So do you think, like, frozen skeleton? Yeah. Uh, or just bones that are enchanted? Uh, weirwood thrown? Yeah, I think it might Bondage. be. <laughs> I think it might be like a uh, like a blood raven situation where there's going to be like a gnarled, uh, twisted weirwood throne with its roots and branches uh, just wrapped around this skeleton, and but at the same time, like that one's. But you also think of it as like kind of an unmarked grave of well, this is the one that we don't. We're they're here to honor them because they were family but we really don't want them getting any kind of recognition, which is why I say like the idea that the, the Knights King's name was stricken from the records, that there's a cover up, but they're still kind of at the very least acknowledging that it happened. Even if they don't want the world to know that it happened. Um, but one thing I was thinking of with Knights Queen. I like uh, all that, by the way. One thing I was thinking of with Knight, Knights Queen is that, uh, if she was, if she was the other, and if she's the progenitor of the others, then George might be playing with the idea of the mother of abominations, which, uh, and again, talking about these ice and fire parallels, he'd be doing the same thing with Melisandre. And this could still work too, even if a uh, Night's Queen was a Stark. Uh, what you have here is an icy priestess and a fire priestess because in the mother the mother of abominations is also known as the great mother which is very close to the great other but she is also known in the in the Limic lore as the scarlet woman and this is also the same as the whore of babylon Whore of babylon. to use the word but that's that's the phrase right 
Yeah, I had it in there. I was trying to avoid it. No, but but that's the thing is that we've discovered before that there are specific correlations between that idea and Daenerys as well as Melisandre. Um, And uh, it's cooler. It's a cooler link than it sounds like at first when you hear that word, of course. Um, Mm -hmm. I I, I need to go look up the research behind it. Uh, But it's definitely a thing. So when I saw this in here, I knew there was something to it. I didn't quite understand what you were getting at at first, but Danny and Melisandre do have a lot of parallels. And obviously we've talked about Night's Queen and Melisandre being parallel characters. So uh, I'm just basically piping in to say, that I think this is, there's something you're onto something here. Go ahead. And also I see that super chat and I'll get it in a second. And clear right. stop. Okay. Carry so on. I do have a quote about the mother of abominations. This is from uh magic without tears, which is uh, Alice which is an Aleister Crowley book. She guardeth the abyss and in her is a perfect purity of that, which is above yet. She is sent as the redeemer to them that are below for there is no other way into the supernal mystery, but through her and the beast on which she rideth. She cannot say no. Her decisions are devoid of authority. She is the fruit that will grow in a sea of darkness, the sea of light that the great Samuel has taken the seed that will be weapon that will make all the damned surpass the old God. And just so many of those words that are like the seed that grows in the darkness, that which will surpass the old God. And then I had to actually look up the uh, dictionary definition of supernal, supernal, which I don't think I'm pronouncing right, but it means relating to the sky or the heavens and the celestial. <clears throat> and so, um, and this fits to me because uh, I do think that mother goddess mythology is really important in the stories, and that, and I think that George views that role of mother as being very sacred, and we can see that in a lot of places. Um, You know, the role of Nissa Nissa opening up the weirwood net is one part of that. Uh, but the like when you talk about the others, it's basically spelled out in the Night's King legend. Whenever you think it happened, that Night's Queen is the magical woman first. Like she already has ice eyes. Mm-hmm. Then she takes the seed and soul of Night's King, who who starts off as a mortal man, a man by light of day, it's said. <clears throat> and then essentially fathers the others or creates children that could be given to the others. Now, we've seen Craster and Gilly do this. Gilly is not a magic woman. She's a human woman. Craster might have some magic blood. We were going to talk about the idea he could be Eamon's son. He's the bastard of some Night's Watchmen. Um, but the point is, neither one of them are magical people uh, like Night's Queen was. And yet their sons can be given to the others and somehow used by the others to make more others or sustain their existence, something like that. Um, But Night's Queen being a magical woman, her children would have come out of her womb, probably icy already, just like her. Or maybe they came out more like the shadow babies, fully grown magical shadow beings instead of human babies. Because let me let me put it this way. Do you think Melisandre could have a normal baby at this point? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. She eats I, fire no. for food and she doesn't need to sleep. She's running mm-hmm. on Relore power and she makes shadow babies with her womb. So I don't think she has a switch inside for shadow babies or like human babies. I think the shadow babies are partly a result. Like the fact that she, she can only have them because she is transforming into a fire entity. And Night's Queen already is an ice entity when she has these children with Night's King. So to me, it's likely that the children of Night's King and Queen probably came out more like the Shadow Babies, like others, and that the, that weirwood organism at the Night Fort was used. That's the weirwood component used in the creation of the others. But getting back to your idea, this idea of a great mother is present on both ice and fire. Um, the Moon Mother is the mother of dragons. Danny's mother of dragons role is super prominent. Um, and so the idea that the main figure of the others is the, is the, is the mother, some unholy mother, it, it really does fit with all of that stuff that you were bringing up. Um, 
and it seems like it's just believable to me. That's that that it, it it just fits with the vibe of what's going on with the character of Night's Queen and all the parallel characters to her. Mm. So that's pretty cool. Um, and like I said, it enhances the comparison between Night's Queen and Melisandre, since Melisandre definitely has um, some of that symbolism that we were talking about and that you mentioned. Yeah. And I, in my notes, I did, I raised it as more of a question. I want to get your opinion on this because when we th hear Knights King and Knights Queen, that he gave her his seed and his soul and that they formed an unholy union. Do you think that he actually, like he took her for his queen, but do you think there was an actual marriage involved or is the whole point of unholy union just talking about that, what they were doing through sex and creating other babies? Yeah. I tend to think that, um, you know, the ceremony of marriage is essentially a ritual designed to symbolize all the things that are really happening when a man and woman commit their, or, or two people, let's say, sorry to overly gender that, when two people commit to each other to spend uh, their life together. That's the thing that's actually happening. The ceremony is a collection of symbols and rituals to sort of draw out that meaning. So when we're talking about a magical union, it's the union that's important. Like, I don't, I don't know what rituals they would have went about, um, you know, uh, an icy ring with a, with a blue star sapphire was, was placed delicately on the, on the ladylike fingers of Night's Queen. I don't, I don't know. Um, but we could probably say that there certainly were magic rituals in front of weirwood trees involved somewhere with this creation of the others. And I strongly think that Night Fort Weirwood had something to do with it as well. So I don't know what, think more magic rituals than wedding rituals, I would guess. Mm -hmm. And the point would be the unholy union. And and quite frankly, Grey Waste Tim, Night's Queen may never have existed in the physical world at all. Mm -hmm. She could be a personification of the Weirwood spirit. She could be Deadness and Nissa's spirit, which seems to have gone inside the Weirwood net. It may have been, sent over to the icy side. Um, and so when it says that Night's Queen saw, or Night's King saw the Corpse Queen north of the wall and chased her, well, north of the wall sometimes is used as a symbol of inside the realm of the dead, basically. Okay, the frozen haunted forest, lands of always winter where nothing grows. It's a realm of the dead location, just like the Stark underworld. So Night's King, seeing this frozen woman beyond the wall. Now, he might have seen her inside the Weirwood net, actually. And it could be that this, because I've been saying Knight Azor High sent his spirit into the Weirwood net and invaded the Weirwood net. I've also said that Azor High became Knight's King. So it's pretty easy to see how maybe he his spirit is inside the Weirwood net. That is where the Knight's King, Knight's Queen thing comes out. And then the others are popping out of the Weirwood tree. The Weirwood tree is effectively the womb and the Knight's Queen that the others are coming out of. And so her spirit is in the tree. Um, and this whole thing was more like going on in the magical realm than in the physical realm. Um, one possibility that is out there. Uh, I tend to think she was probably real person, uh, physical entity, more like Melisandre. But the idea yeah, of this all happening thing. inside the astral plane is tempting too. I'm on the physical the idea that she was a real woman too. And when we go to the idea of, okay, of the other side, that Knight's Queen was the Stark. Uh, and if uh, so, that would, if Knight's King is Azor Ahai, or just at the very least, some kind of dragon Lord figure from the far East, if he were to marry that I would, if he were to marry her, then I do see this as them getting married in a God's wood by a weirwood, in which case you would then have a dragon Lord, being wedded to the trees, which might have been a prerequisite to how he was able to even get invade the weirwood net in the first place. I'm um, sorry, the bird distracted me there for a second. Uh, can you repeat that last sentence? Uh, I was saying that um, if Azor Ahai married a Stark woman, if he participated in a ceremony that honored the old gods, then that would mean you would have a dragon lord being wedded to the trees. Yes. So some version of that is going on. It's only a question of like how, how this is represented at various stages in the real world and inside the weirwood net. But yeah, the idea of 
see my my theory on again the Azor High Nissa Nissa murder uh, is that that was Isle of Faces weirwood sacrifice event. So Nissa Nissa should be seen as a child of the forest woman, maybe a, a hybrid or a green woman. I don't know, but she's a weirwood woman of some kind, and Azor High would be killing her in a god's wood in front of a weirwood tree. Mm. So it would very much look like weirwood sacrifice rituals and and northern weddings also take place inside godwood so it's going to be something of a sacrifice wedding magical you know fuck job <laughs> basically <laughs> and and you see that with um drogo you know drogo's pyre is it's it's also mimicking danny's wedding to drogo and there's all this two become one language and they're both reborn drogo's reborn as a smoky stallion that rides up to the red comet which is another rebirth of his while Danny is reborn out of the pyre. So, you know, John's resurrection pyre is also going to be a rebirth thing. And uh, so you see kind of how, um, uh, how was that? I'm trying, I'm sorry. I'm trying to relate that back to what we were saying. Um, and my ADD is firing. Oh, just the, the wedding, the wedding ceremony potentially between Azor and, and, um, Nissa Nissa, who again, it's really hard to tell Tim if Nissa Nissa and Knight's Queen are different people. They're at the at a minimum, they're very related. Uh, if Nissa Nissa was a child of the forest woman, then Knight's Queen may have been so as well. And that's the sense in which they're like sisters. Or yeah. it could be that Corpse Queen or Knight's Queen is Nissa Nissa's spirit come back out of the friggin' weirwood net or her body reanimated if she really was a corpse. Um, yeah. there's a few possibilities, but it makes uh, that it makes that circle of what we said like at the very beginning of the stream. Like George makes it very ambiguous as to are these all the same person? Are they only two, or is it all three individuals? Because you could have Nissa is Nissa Nissa and Night's Queen the same person? Is Nissa Nissa and the Amethyst Empress the same person? Are all three of the same person? Is it two out of three? Is it three separate? It's but without any kind of concrete evidence, and all we have are these legends. It's like really up for grabs. What exactly is going on here? Maybe they were all the same person. And again, these are just cu different cultural interpretations of the same story. Yeah. And George, you know, he's never really going to probably parse all of that uh, out. We will get not. some answers because Bran will see some key things in the weirwood net that he needs to know. And the most important thing will be, how does this all play out again? We will see the specifics of whatever John, Danny and Bran do. And from there, we might be able to pin down more about the original events. Um, but Real quick, I just want to thank all of my mods who always do a good job, and also everyone in the chat. Um, most people are incredibly polite and kind here. We've got a really good uh, environment that we have fostered, and uh, I, it, you know, one way to to lose the privileges of being able to comment and participate would be to argue with my mods. So I just want to say, if one of the mods asks you to drop a comment or leave something alone that's potentially your last warning become before I come in off the top rope, see you arguing with the mod and just psh, uh, ban you. Cause I don't like to really linger on those decisions. I just make them. So uh, thank you mods. And if, if God help you, if one of the mods asks you to leave something alone, I would please do that uh, because that's how we maintain the friendly, happy environment that uh, we all value so much. So thank you mods. And Yes, thank you, Mods. Uh, there you go. <laughs> Thanks for picking up picking up the slack without me because I'm doing this. Yeah, I mean, nobody's none of these mods. There's making, never much I'm not slack. Paying anybody to do this, you know. So I appreciate all the participation and the help that all y'all give me. And people have been sending me tea and rocks and all kinds mm -hmm. of happy things. So just you know, want to keep the community positive and say that I appreciate those of you holding it down as pillars of our little myth head community. Right, and so just, that being said, um, just one more point that I just want to make about this idea of a possible wedding between Night's King and Night's Queen is going back on that. I, of what I said about why is John's oh, Damon, you're calling on my shoulder. <laughs> why is uh Night's King coming off the top rope is Tim's cat. Uh, yep. This is, this is Damon. <laughs> um, one idea I had is that if they weren't married, that any children that they have, and which we're talking, we, we talk about the stolen other baby, the half, half human, half other on paper, if they weren't married, they'd be a bastard. 
which could mean that they were the one that was named Jon Snow. And that's why it's a cursed name. Yeah, I definitely think there's a strong association with the idea of northern bastards and other children, um, whether it's the idea of Craster giving his sons to the others, maybe an ancient custom where that bastard children would be given to the others, um, you know, or the idea of bastards of the north being called snow because there was, you know, a snowy bastard, a bastard Stark who became another, something like that. So I definitely think there's a link there. Um, and the idea of there being a place called Snowgate is a clue about passing baby snows through gates, you know, in the wall, like the like the Black Gate at the Night Fort or something like that. So mm -hmm. definitely think there's something to that. Uh, uh, Do you say your cat's name is Damon? Yes, his name is Damon. Now, so you got to watch out for Damons because Damons are leapers. They like to, <laughs> you know, leap from one dragon to the other or from one chair to somebody's shoulder, you know. <laughs> <clears throat> in any case so um is there anything else we want to say about knights king and queen you've got something about the barrow king in here uh yeah, so that was uh going on what the mate how the maesters tried to attribute who was the knight's queen like that she was that she probably was just a human woman and they, the maesters attributed to her to being a daughter of the barrow king because of how the barrows are associated with uh death and graves and things like that and that's why i noted well if the barrow king when the when the barrow king submitted to the starks just like with a lot of uh other kings in the north who would eventually submit to the starks there uh the king of winter at the time married his daughter and the same thing happens with the marsh kings when they submitted there were Star starks would marry the marsh king's daughter uh when the war king was defeated the stark king married their daughter uh same thing when the boltons uh when the boltons finally yielded you have these stark bolton intermarriages skagos like it goes on and on the starks kind of if, if they don't take it peaceful whether through peaceful means or through violent means when they do finally get someone to submit to them uh, or someone to yield, it's usually followed with a marriage. And so that's why uh, maybe Knight's Queen was, act if she's a Stark, she might have been the daughter of a Stark uh, Barrow, daughter of a Barrow King uh, marriage pact. Yeah, and <clears throat> so two points on that. One is that uh, more broadly speaking, this the simple idea that pacts are concluded with marriages or, you know, uh fostering children with each other certainly is seems to be such a prominent thing in the story in part to suggest that this may have been the case with any potential pact with the others um that there may have been an exchange of brides or children in order to cement that pact uh so i like that idea and the other thing is that if we're talking about the barrow kings well we're talking about house dustin house dustin is the house uh, that lives on those mounds and traces their lineage to the Barrow King. So isn't it interesting that Lady Dustin is being led sinister down to the Lady crypts. Dustin is going down into the crypts with the and, and then talking about how she wants to be a Stark um, and was engaged to a Stark and then now hates the Starks. So I don't I'd, I'd have to go back and read over that whole conversation and think about it as Knights Queen stuff. Mm -hmm. But we do have a, a Dustin queen, you know, down there in the crypts at one point. So that's that's pretty interesting. And I raised the maester point about the barrows because it does say uh, one maester, Maester Kennet, wrote a book, Passages of the Dead. And he mentions that a curse was placed on the great barrow, weakening and making corpse like any living man who dared to equal the first king. Well, the Stark's king are daring to equal the kings the barrow kings because they just subjugated them and if we take this idea of the of a stark marrying the barrow king's daughter and a curse is made that any that anyone who tries to take the barrow kings can become corpse like that might have that might have been an infliction that happened to the stark king that subjugated them and that could be something that's carried on through the lit through the lineage of uh, through whatever children he may have sired upon the barrow king's daughter or even to flip it around you could say that the the reason why there's a bear a myth such as that is because there was originally a great king 
who became corpse-like mm. something behind and it had something to do with his marriage to Night's queen because mm. that's the whole thing stannis gives his seed and soul to melisandre to make the shadows but that makes him emaciated and corpse-like every time we see him after a shadow baby procreation he looks way worse um so he's turning into a corpse by having the shadows and mel yeah. says his life fires are so low he could die if i tried to make another son so knight's king giving his seed and soul to knight's queen should also transform him mm -hmm. uh so he's he that whole idea of becoming corpse like is is could potentially be right there yeah um I need to encroach, be, stop before I encroach on Great King territory. That's that's Crowfoot's daughter. <laughs> that's her. That's her bang. <clears throat> yeah, for sure. Shout out to Crowfoot's daughter and the Disputed Lands channel. So, it's probably a good place to wrap it up. It's been a great stream, Tim. You did very well. Shout out to Tim once again, and uh, you are the Gray Waste on Twitter, right? At the Gray yes. Waste. Yes, you can follow me at the Gray Waste. Uh, if you want to read my essay, Fagon, A Parallel of Kings, Princes, and Pretenders, that is my pinned tweet. Uh, also want to give a shout out to Gray Area. I mod for her, Dire Wolf City, uh, and her co-hosts, uh, Totes Not Alice, uh, Nim Shadow, and I Eat Zebra. Uh, they stream Sunday nights at 8.30, so when LML is wrapping up for the night, if you still got a a song of ice and fire itch you got to scratch then hop on over to dire wolf city and uh and if you're like me if you're also a fan of american horror story then please subscribe to i eat zebra she just passed uh the thousand subscriber milestone but she can always use more and she's one of my twitter besties fellow fagon fans so shout out to aura and yeah that's a uh, that's about everything that i want to that i want to market <laughs> Cool. Well, you did you did great, Tim, and I really appreciate having you on. You brought a lot to the stream here. Um, significantly better than it would have been if it was just me wandering around the crypts in my nimble dick costume shouting <laughs> about this and that. So uh, <laughs> appreciate that. And uh, if you do like nimble dick shouting, of course, check out uh, nimble dick squisher hunt from this past Sunday. Again, my finest work and greatest contribu contribution to the fandom by far, by far. Check that out. So, guys, thanks a lot. Um, the next thing you will see from me is probably going to be my Melisandre Secrets 4 video. Um, I don't know if I could bring myself to live stream again until that thing is finished. Um, hopefully, I'll have it finished by, like, maybe for a release on Sunday. Uh, but stay tuned. You guys know where I'm at on social media, at the Dragon LML on Twitter, David Lightbringer on Instagram. And uh, you can also join the Mythhead Family Facebook group. And any of those things will keep you in the loop. And of course, you should be subscribed to the channel with your subscription set to all. And that means no matter what I do, when I do it, and again, I do have ADHD and I'm not super consistent, you'll get a little notification and be able to check it out. So thanks a lot, guys. And enjoy the rest of your week. And thank you so much, Gray Waste Tim. You were excellent. Let me get some applause in the chat for Gray Waste Tim. And I'll see you guys soon. Thank you.